we're all here. I um, want to welcome the public hello uh, and say thanks for joining the City of Santa Rosa's first ever virtual community meeting. This one in response to the COVID-19 homeless emergency response, and this is an emergency. So I'll start, I'm David Gwine, I'm the Director of Housing and Community Services, and will be serving as the moderator for this future meeting and answer some questions. I wanna go over our agenda for tonight, which is in four parts. We start with introductions and welcoming comments by Santa Rosa Mayor Tom Schwedhelm. We then go to a presentation of the safe social distancing program envisioned at the Finley site. We then go into a question and answer period. And we'll talk more about that in a moment because there's some uh, steps you have to take. And then we close the meeting with remarks by Mayor Schwedhelm. Just want to say about the goal of the meeting. Our goal today and for the presentation that you should be able to see us all on the Zoom platform and that we want to present and answer questions on what? What Santa Rosa is doing in response to this emergency? Why? Why are we taking these actions and why Finley was selected as the most appropriate location? Where? Where at Finley will we be providing safe social distancing? When? when the setup of this temporary site will occur, and when will the parking area be restored to its original use, and how we plan to accomplish this work to protect unsheltered people and our community from this virus. So let me start by introducing the people on the screen. We, of course, have Mayor Tom Schwedhelm joining us tonight, Kelly Kuykendall, our Homeless Service Program Manager. We have Jenny Lynn Holmes, our Chief Program Officer, Catholic Charities of, the, of Santa Rosa, Finley Operator. We have Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager, who among other duties oversees the city's parks and facilities. Tina Rivera joins us from the County of Sonoma. She's the Assistant Director of Health Services, as well as the Assistant Director of the Community Development Commission with the County of Sonoma. And we have our Public Safety Representatives, Captain John Cregan of the Santa Rosa Police Department, and Battalion Chief Mike McCallum of the Santa Rosa Fire Department. And behind the scenes operating this virtual meeting is our City Clerk Stephanie Williams and Assistant City Clerk Dina Manis, who will coordinate questions from the public and act as the meeting host. So that is our goal. That is our uh, panel. And at this time, Mayor, I'd like to turn it over to you if you'd like to make some opening remarks. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to everyone for participating in this important community discussion. You know, the past eight or nine weeks have been extremely difficult for all of us. The city of Santa Rosa has been in a very unique situation and challenging situation in that we don't have any public health officials. So we are responding to orders and direction as provided by uh, Governor Newsom and out of the Sonoma County Public Health Office. This is especially challenging when addressing those members of our community who are experiencing homelessness. Tonight, you're gonna to hear about the city's efforts and how our strategies have been guided by direction from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Sonoma County Public Health Officer, the California Judicial Council, and case law out of the federal courts. Let's make no mistake about this. The city of Santa Rosa is currently dealing with two significant emergencies, our homeless emergency and the COVID-19 pandemic emergency. I really encourage everyone with a question to ask it. We've been continuously updating the city's website with answers to the questions that we're receiving. I really encourage everyone to visit the city's webpage at srcity.org backslash COVID-19 homeless support. It is absolutely the best location to find up-to-date and accurate information about the situation. Please go to that site and don't rely on other sources of information for information related to this. I also wanna thank Tina for joining us from the county. As we've been demonstrating over the last few years, we look at homelessness as a regional issue and just not a city or individual entity's responsibility. I also wanna thank, I know other members of the city council are not participants in this meeting, but they're definitely listening in because I can assure you all seven of us on the Santa Rosa City Council are interested in what folks have to say here and any suggestions they may have for us moving forward. So with that, I'll give it back to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So we move into the second stage of our agenda, which is a brief presentation 
uh, coordinated by Kelly Kaingadal and Jenny Lynn Holmes, and we'll try and get that up on everyone's screen to see in the moment. Just want to make sure that uh, my fellow panelists can see the presentation so I know it's live for the public as well. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. This is Kelly Kuykendall. I'm the um, city's homeless service manager and I work in the Housing and Community Services Department. I'll be presenting this evening with Jenny Lynn Holmes. Dave introduced her already and she's with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa. So to provide you with a brief overview of the presentation, we will cover city homeless programs, um, the city's COVID-19 homeless emergency response, the safe social distancing program, which is the subject of tonight's meeting. I'll cover some of the questions that have been coming in from um, our concerned citizens and residents. We'll go over resources. Um, at the conclusion, we'll have an update from Captain Cregan and Battalion Chief Mike McCallum, and then we'll move into the question and answer session. So city homeless service programs, um, the city supports and provides funding in five uh, key areas. We provide funding to day services at the Homeless Service Center. That's a drop-in center in downtown Santa Rosa at 600 Morgan Street. That's operated by Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities also operates two emergency shelters, a family shelter, which is near the Homeless Service Center in downtown. And that provides up to 138 year-round year be beds for families experiencing homelessness. We also operate and fund, or Catholic Charities operates, and we fund the um, Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter. That's on the west side of town, and that provides up to 213 year-round year round beds for single adults experiencing homelessness. We have the street outreach team, that's the homeless outreach services team, and our encampment resolution team, that's the homeless encampment assistance program. And housing support, so through our outreach team, we offer uh, rental assistance, and help with security deposits. There's also a landlord um, or housing first fund that provides incentives to landlords to rent to persons experiencing homelessness. And through our housing and community services department, we also have affordable housing programs through our Santa Rosa Housing Trust and uh, rental assistance through the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. In terms of community-based solutions, we have the Community Homeless Assistance Program, otherwise known as CHAP. And that allows for private property, property owners to use their property for homeless services. Um, and that's primarily achieved through the provision of safe parking in our community. In terms of our COVID-19 homeless emergency response, the city has taken a number of actions to date and these are outlined in this slide. In mid-March, we moved 45 high-risk individuals from the Sam Jones Hall shelter into motel rooms. And when I say high-risk, I mean individuals who are um, 65 years and older or have underlying health conditions that put them at risk to exposure to COVID-19. So we did this to create social distancing in our shelter, as well as to protect these individuals from potential exposure to COVID-19. In late March, we worked with the County um, Emergency Operations Center to place portable toilets and hand washing stations at our near known encampments in Santa Rosa. I know this was done throughout the county. The city also provided um, refuse containers or dumpsters. Um, they were located at our near known encampments. In mid-April, outreach was conducted to um, unsheltered individuals living in encampments and an additional 26 high-risk individuals were placed in motel rooms. So that's a total of 71 motel rooms um, that have been secured for high-risk individuals and 77 individuals. We also distributed face masks to encampments um, for individuals living in encampments. And here we are in May, and we're talking with you this evening about um, the safe social distancing program as our next step um, in our COVID-19 response. The next couple slides, I'll cover the safe social distancing program and Jenny Lynn will join me in that. Just to touch briefly on the purpose of the program. This is um, along with the other action steps the city's taken to date is to create social distancing uh, within existing encampments in response to COVID-19. 
we're also trying to protect our vulnerable homeless um, residents and and doing so the community at large. And this is a temporary site. So the, the goal, the plan for this program is that it will be in place so long as um, the Sonoma County Health Officer shelter in place order is, is in effect. And unlike past actions of the city to um, close encampments and resolve encampments, our focus with this program is emergency response related specifically to COVID-19. So it's different than past encampment resolution efforts. It's not related to a closure. And we recognize that the 70 spots that we're setting up at the Finley Community Center will not be able to accommodate all individuals um, that are, are living outside at this time. I also want to note that the site is um, will be uh, will be prioritizing and targeting encampments most in need of social distancing and bringing individuals into the site. Um, we'll be referring any at risk risk individuals to the um, the non congregate shelter that's been set up at Sonoma State. However, if individuals that are at risk want to come into the Finley site, that is also an option. Here we have a visual of the Finley Community Center campus. You can see um, the orange highlighted um, area on the screen is the parking lot, and that is between the person senior wing and the tennis courts. The next slide I have has um, drone footage, so give me just a sec to pull it up. This minute will last uh, about a minute, uh, this video, the drone footage, sorry, will last about a minute and gives you another visual of where the site is at um, between the person's senior wing and the tennis courts. You can see the area is fenced. We're proposing up to 70 tents. Each tent can accommodate one to two people. We're not anticipating having 140 individuals at the site. That's merely the tent capacity. The tents are not there yet. They should be up by tomorrow. And we are placing them um, 12 feet apart from each other. Um, in alignment with the Centers for Disease Control guidance on social distancing for encampments. And I just want to highlight that this site is managed and secured 24-7 um, by Catholic Charities and Private Security. And we'll go into a little bit more detail um, in the next couple of slides with that. You can see the white tent that's set up right now. That's the, the staff tent. The truck next to that is the area where the sanitary facilities will be. And there's two entry and exit points that will, will be staffed 24 seven. There's parking reserved outside um, specifically for emergency vehicles. With that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny Lynn. Already covered this slide, just talking about um, how, many, how many sites, uh, how many tents will be there in the CDC guidance. So the next couple slides I'm turning over to Jenny Lynn. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, thank you to everyone who's interested in learning more about this uh, program. So just to kind of go through a few of the operational items, um, we'll cover a, a variety of them, we'll try to get some initial analysis around the questions that came in to try to uh, proactively address them, but I'm sure more will be asked and answered hopefully during the questions uh, time we have saved during this uh, conversation. So. Just to kind of uh, piggyback on what Kelly was mentioning around the screening and engagement. So uh, our street outreach host team has been out uh, working with individuals in our in the encampments. Again, we're kind of we're focusing on the uh, most densely populated encampments in the city, the ones that are most in need of social distancing. And uh, the initial triage that everyone's working through is uh, identifying individuals who are in the high risk category that if they are to contract COVID-19. Um, would have a higher likelihood of complications or even uh, due to the virus. So people over the age of 65 or with serious chronic medical conditions. Um, we're working with those individuals to try to get them into the County of Sonoma's uh, non-congregate shelter site. Um, and that was Kelly mentioned with that SSU. Uh, for individuals that um, that's potentially not an option for, we will be screening for them to come into uh, the Finley site. Uh, we've started that process over the last couple of days and have already identified several people who are um, uh, looking forward to the opportunity to come into the program. Uh, with the program uh, operations, we will be holding uh, expectations of individuals that are in the 
uh, site. Um, every person that will be coming in will be offered the opportunity to review those expectations and to um, uh, ultimately sign off an agreement that this is a, a good program that would work for them and their certain situations. Um, some of those things was, you know, really focusing on the health and safety of that site, of the individual, and everyone involved in the surrounding area and programs. Uh, we also will be having, as uh, was mentioned, uh, on-site security as well as on-site staff. The staff that's on-site will be uh, are people who actually have long-standing relationships with many of these individuals um, and will be working towards offering a variety of services to help the individual in the moment to keep them safe, but also to kind of help them with their longer-term transition into potential uh, housing options as well. Uh, the security company will be there 24-7. Uh, uh, we will have uh, one during the day alongside of three other on-site staff. And then we'll also have two uh, security officers there during the evenings. Uh, we'll be staffing the entry and exit to make sure, again, not only that um, the individuals inside of the program are safe, but that we're limiting outside contact to keep it safe um, and free of potential social distancing issues and, and uh, outside uh, individuals bringing in things like uh, potential exposure to COVID-19. Um, some of the services that will be offered, Kelly mentioned several of them. Uh, there will be on-site showers. Uh, we have a laundry service that we'll be providing for the individuals who be living in this, in this site. Uh, we also will have restroom facilities and meal services. We're partnering with a couple of our local restaurants who, um, to kind of help out from that perspective as well and uh, provide meals on-site for the individuals. Uh, additionally, our staff who is uh, thoroughly trained in the area of homeless services and trauma-informed care will be providing on-site service and housing navigation. Uh, they will be doing community referrals, continuing to help the individual, you know, with, uh, with different things that they might need. We have a fantastic partnership through St. Joseph uh, Mobile Medical Unit, and they'll be providing on-site medical services a, a couple of days a week. So they'll get on-site medical care as well as behavioral health support through a variety of different partnerships we have across uh, the County of Sonoma and other nonprofit partners. So if we look at the, the next slide, um, I will kind of go into our uh, COVID-19 uh, safety protocols. One of the things that we did early on as a homeless service operator was uh, to uh, look at creating through guidance that we're receiving from national and state partners, how we can take preventative measures within these programs to make sure that we are keeping everybody safe and making sure that everyone is uh, hopefully limiting the exposure to this. Um, so some of the preventative measures that we will have been taking in other facilities and operations and will continue through this one is a lot of around education, keeping the individuals in our programs informed around what the latest health guidance is, um, how they can be proactive in, you know, limiting exposure and, you know, clean and health and san health sanitation uh, guidelines as well. We'll have on-site hygiene supplies. We'll be making sure that individuals are um, having access to the hand washing stations that will be brought in. Uh, social distancing will also be um, part of this. It's kind of the whole idea behind the site. We'll have 12 feet between 12 feet between the tents, and then when individuals are not in their tents, we'll be uh, helping to remind people of the six feet uh, requirement, as well as face coverings that are also being um, asked of individuals right now. Uh, for those individuals that are considered to be in the high risk category, we'll do some special precautionary regulatory monitoring to make sure that individuals are not appearing symptomatic so that we can get them to the medical care that they would need. If so, um, we will be limiting visitors into the site, again, to limit exposure to COVID-19 from outside. Uh, there will be a, a visitor's area set up for individuals uh, to, again, safely and socially distant way, uh, provide that opportunity for the resident for people who've been living in this, in this, this, this site. And uh, we will also be looking at um, a COVID screening product protocol. So we have an, in, uh, our initial screening will happen while the outreach team is out in the field, kind of going over symptoms and seeing if they're um, appearing symptomatic. And then when they appear on site, we will do a secondary screen, which will include taking uh, temperature and so on and so forth. Those uh, screening protocols are also put in place as we are observing individuals who might be symptomatic. We will continue to uh, monitor and, um, and follow the, the screening protocol to make sure that people are safe and secure. Uh, 
Additionally, as part of the program expectations and agreement, this is something that we have in um, a variety of our programs, uh, but we will be asking individuals that are a part of this program to be honoring what we call a good neighbor agreement. And the good neighbor agreement, it really focuses in on the fact that program decisions will be made with the neighborhood in mind. Um, individuals will be screened, as Wade was mentioned earlier. Um, also, we'll be asking people when they sign off on the program expectations and agreement that they agree to be a good neighbor while they are part of this program. Uh, that any behavior that happens uh, in the surrounding neighborhood is asked to be respectful and to um, ultimately allow um, for us to hold accountability around uh, them being a good neighbor while we're in this uh, in this operation. Um, for the overwhelming majority of the time, uh, people who are in our programs are more than happy to uh, agree and abide by this and often become proactive um, individuals in the helping the, the surrounding neighborhood. So um, if this was not to be the case, a violation of this would jeopardize the participants' continued involvement in the program. Uh, then a couple of other quick guidelines that we'll be uh, helping out with, uh, and then we'll continue on during the question and answer part, I'm sure. Uh, parking permits, so we will be, um, you know, mo trying to monitor the flow of individuals. If someone does have a vehicle, we'll be going through a parking, parking permit process. Um, additionally, pets and service animals will be allowed in the uh, site. Um, service animals obviously have their own uh, process that we go through. Pets, we're allowing dogs, one dog per person, um, and we do hold expectations around certain screenings that we have to take around that, um, vaccination and, and so on and so forth in that realm. Uh, there'll be one pet per person and, and five per, for the whole site, but hope we will also be taking exceptions and kind of working with individuals in their, in their specific needs. And then last but not least, um, there, we are looking at while we're in a shelter in place, under a shelter in place order, that there will be a curfew um, at 8 p.m. every night. Again, mostly to protect the individuals that are, that are there and knowing that um, uh, this is kind of an expectation that we're only really doing, you know, traveling to essential services. Uh, and uh, so that will be something that we will be looking at from an operational standpoint as well. Um, so with that, I think those are the highlights. Again, there's a lot more detail um, that we can go into as we continue through this meeting, but I'll turn it back over to Kelly to find, finish our presentation. Thank you, Jenny Lynn. The next couple, excuse me, <clears throat> in the next couple slides, um, I'm just gonna cover some of the questions that we've been receiving from um, uh, neighbors and businesses and just concerned uh, residents. And so there's three sort of broad categories. There's general, um, I'll start with that. And so we've had a lot of questions around site selection and decision-making process. I'll touch on that brief briefly. The question has basically been, why Finley? Um, and I will tell you that we looked at city parking lots um, throughout citywide across the city. Um, we convened a cross-departmental uh, team and our, our, our partner um, provider, Catholic Charities. This included input from police and fire in terms of looking at different sites for um, health and safety and visibility. Um, we were also looked at the CDC guidance and our um, health officer's order. And also, um, we, we, we landed on the Finley site for a number of reading, reasons, including that the Finley Community Center is currently closed due to the um, uh, shelter in place order. Um, and that it's also there, the, the facility has a large parking lot where we wouldn't have to take up the whole parking lot for this particular program. Um, in terms of decision making, so I mentioned the staff analysis and recommendation. We convened a subcommittee of the city council comprised of Mayor Schwethelm and um, Council Member Dodd. And um, also under the, the order, the emergency order that we're operating under, we, we landed on the, the Finley site. And I just wanna acknowledge to all of you that are on the call tonight who live near the site or do business there or um, you know, frequent the area that we understand for you, this is not the perfect site. Um, and that really any site for a program like this in Santa Rosa would be faced with a significant amount of, of opposition and, and we understand that and we, we hear that. So 
Moving on to outreach to uh, nearby residents and businesses, in addition to the meeting that's happening this evening, letters were mailed out in English and Spanish to all residents and property owners within a quarter mile radi radius of the site, so about 1,500 um, to about 1,500 addresses. A news release went out on uh, May 6 to various media outlets. We've been, as the mayor mentioned, um, putting information on our website, um, you know, on a regular basis and actually updating our FAQ almost daily at this point. An e-blast and tech mess text messages went out to approximately 68,000 um, citizens who were subscribed to city, the city's news updates. And also we pushed out the information on Nextdoor. In terms of um, public, you know, we've had a lot of questions around why are we allowing encampments to exist in a public health emergency? And I think our public safety, Captain Cregan will be touching on that, but I will provide a few points on that. We're following the guidance of the CDC, which discourages against the displacing encampments. Um, we're also following the um, health officer order. Um, the terms of a preliminary, preliminary injunction resulting from a lawsuit that the city and county are party to. Um, we're dealing with uh, limited, limited shelter capacity right now, which is, makes it difficult for us to enforce. Um, and um, those are sort of some of the key things that are driving our encampment response right now. In terms of Finley, we've had some questions about, you know, how will the program impact uh, the, the, the Finley Community Center itself? And that center, the facility is closed um, while the shelter in place order is in effect. So there's no immediate impact there between the two, between the facility and the program. And in the event of an emergency, we would still be able to use Finley as an evacuation center um, with this program in place. In terms of timeline, as I, I think I've already mentioned, the goal for the program is that it will be in place as long as the shelter in place order is in effect. And we've had a lot of questions from the community about why not the fairgrounds. And I know uh, Mayor Schwedhelm will probably wanna speak to city county collaboration and Tina Rivera is on um, the call as well. But I will add that the county is looking at the fairgrounds for their indoor outdoor shelter program. That was discussed by the Board of Supervisors in March and that has been delayed because of our current COVID-19 response. I will say that the county is currently using trailers provided uh, by the state at the fairgrounds for um, a temporary shelter during um, our emergency response. And the fairgrounds property is county property and subject to the discretion of the Board of Supervisors. So just cover a couple of questions that we've received. And I will say we updated our FAQ again before the meeting. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time yesterday and this morning going over the more than 100 questions we've received. And so we're doing our best to um, incorporate that in the presentation, update our FAQs, and we'll try to address those this, this evening. But any that we don't get tonight, we will certainly be adding to our, our FAQ, and there's other ways that you can reach out to us, which I'll share at the, the conclusion of the presentation. Okay, in terms of cost, there's about $4,000 in site setup costs, and we anticipate approximately $150,000 to run the program a month. That's for services and supplies. Outreach, uh, services, site management, um, Jenny Lynn, I think, covered that very well, and we can go more into that in the Q&A. And encampment versus, manage, versus, versus a managed site, we're getting questions from the public, like, how is this not going to look like the Gerardo Trail encampment? Um, you know, is it going to look like the, down, the downtown, the underpass encampments? And I will say, there's a difference between... Um, some of those encampments in a managed site. As we've already gone over, this is fenced, it's secured, there's services. Um, so it's very different and people will not be allowed to bring all of their belongings. We do have some structure around, um, around um, storage and, and that sort of thing. And in terms of pets, Jenny Lynn touched on that, but I wanna say that pet owners, we are allowing dogs and service animals will be required to comply with uh, park rules in terms of only um, allowing their dog in the park where they're where they're allowed and then um, leash law will, will um, apply and also picking up after your pet and we plan on um, providing waste bags for that use. Okay last slide on the FAQs and this one will be real quick because as I mentioned we have um, Captain Cregan here and he's going to provide a public safety update um, and I think Jenny Lynn covered the security but we've had a lot of questions about that. Um, drugs and alcohol, so that will not be allowed on the site. Um, and I think Jenny Lynn touched on how, um, you know, our behavior-based model. Um, lots of concerns around park and neighborhood safety and illegal activity on-site and off-site. 
uh, questions about increased police presence and curfew, um, and Jenny Lynn did touch on the curfew. So this slide before I, um, I wrap up here, next step. So outreach um, to the community as well as individuals living in encampments is happening right now. Um, and as this site set up, we anticipate um, tents and some of the other things coming in by tomorrow. Um, we're aiming to open the program and invite individuals in starting next Monday. It will be phased. We don't anticipate having 70 people on Monday. It'll be more like 10 and then phasing that out through the course of the week. Program operations, as I mentioned, this is a temporary solution. Our goal is that the program will be in place as long as the shelter in place order is in effect. Resources, so as I mentioned, we have a lot of information available on our website. Please go there, check it out. We're updating the FAQs daily. Um, there's an email, homeless at srcity.org. Um, please email in any um, any questions or concerns that you have about it. I do encourage you to look at the FAQ. We're trying to address questions that are coming in that aren't already answered in our FAQ because we're getting an overwhelming amount of, of questions right now and I certainly understand why. Um, we do have a voicemail set up uh, for, for people who don't want to email, who want to call in. You can call in and leave a voicemail with your questions or concerns specifically about this site, the voicemail is being set up for the um, safe social distancing, distancing program at Finley. Leave a message and we'll get back to you um, just as, as soon as we can. With that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Captain Cregan and Mike McCallum to provide a public safety update. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. So again, my name is John Cregan and I manage the patrol bureau here at the Santa Rosa Police Department. So tonight, my goal is to be able to hopefully answer some questions that come in from the community about what some of the concerns are. And the main thing that I wanna let everyone know is that the Santa Rosa Police Department and myself specifically are working very closely with Catholic Charities, with the Housing Community Services, with our other city departments, and we work together. We're meeting daily. I literally have daily contact with Jenny Lynn Holmes and with Kelly and Dave Gwine. We're meeting, we're talking about these issues, and we're going to be working together to manage this site. Some of the concerns are going to come up uh, from the police department, and I want to make it clear that we're managing the criminal behavior that may be associated in the area. And if there's any other uh, influence there on Finley Park, those are the things that the Santa Rosa Police Department is going to be managing. And we'll be working closely with Jenny Lynn Holmes if there are issues in the encampment and officers who are assigned to that patrol area are gonna be making daily checks. And I've already been talking to the patrol sergeants about the need to have extra enforcement and extra presence in that area, to be doing foot patrols of the parks and to have a high visible presence in that area. And the hope to make sure that there are no issues, but to make sure that our neighbors and the community in that area feel protected and feel like they have the resources that we need. We've dedicated that as what we call a beat project. So we're gonna have a dedicated sergeant monitoring uh, the impact in that area making daily contact there at the uh, uh, so social or safe distancing site there and contacting the security guards that are going to be present. So that's going to be one of the things that we're working on. I know there are a lot of questions and community concerns. I get the emails. I get the calls about the increased presence we've seen throughout the city. And the one thing that I want to stress, and I can answer questions one-on-one -on -one with folks about that, is to understand of there are effects citywide from this global pandemic that we're facing. And we've had an influx of people being released from the jails as, as they're following some of the best practices there for uh, low, uh, low offenses that are getting released out into the streets and that's impacted us. And we also have, as Kelly mentioned, about the CDC guidelines. And the CDC guidelines are, the recommendations are we are not to disperse homeless encampments and the goal of that and the intent of those guidelines is so we aren't just moving homeless from spot to spot and we're not increasing some of the spread of this deadly virus. And that doesn't impact just the homeless community, that impacts our whole city. As we see, if we see this disease spreading more quickly through the homeless population, that's gonna lead to surges at the local hospital. That affects not just that very vulnerable community in our uh, city, but it affects every single one else in the city. So we have to work together to think collectively about what's best for our city as a whole. And part of that is why the city do some of the more people coming out of the jails through some of these recommendations is why the city is coming together and partnering with Catholic Charities to come up with this program. 
And the police department's goal is to be able to work with our city partners and with Catholic charities that make this a success, not only for that vulnerable population, but the city as a whole. I'm going to hear the issues and the concerns related to crime in that area. One of the easiest things, if you see criminal behavior, is just to call the police department. If it's an emergency, you call 911. If it's a non-emergency, you can call our non-emergency line at uh, 528-5222. If you just want to report uh, nuisances or you want to just uh, let the police department know about some homeless issues in the area or any other issues, you can even email us at the srpdinfo at srcity.org. Feel free to email me directly. My email is jcregan at srcity.org. I manage the patrol resources. I'll make sure that we're responsive to the complaints that we have in the area and do everything that we legally can to address those issues and work with our city partners. And I'll turn it over uh, to Mike from the fire department. Thanks, John. I'll just uh, just kind of briefly summarize uh, the fire department's involvement in, in establishing this safe social distancing site. Um, kind of echoing what, what Captain Cregan said, we've worked uh, closely with our city partners um, and Catholic charities all throughout the development of this, uh, this program. Um, we've assisted with the site selection, um, the safe design, and addressed both health, and, health safety and fire safety issues um, as the, the site was being developed. And going forward, we'll continue to develop and uh, evaluate and work with those partners um, to make sure the site continues to be safe, fire safe, and, and for the, the health of the residents there. Um, in responding to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic to our community as a whole, um, you know, the fire department supports the Finley Safe Social Distancing site as a safe option. Uh, as we move into fire season, we recognize and realize there's a heightened concern um, regarding fire safety in our community, and especially, you know, revolving around the encampments in our community. Um, with this additional challenge, we believe that taking this proactive approach um, will lessen the impacts to the fire department and the emergency response system as a whole, and lessen the, the fire risk and safety risk to the community as a whole. We will continue to respond to incidents and, and calls for service all throughout the community. Um, this will in no way affect that or slow down um, any uh, emergency response um, to the area surrounding the Finley site. And in, in fact, we hope that it will lessen some of the impact there. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to David and we can move on to some questions. Yeah, thanks all, well done. Um, we're gonna move now into the third of the four part of our agenda, which is the question and answer period, but I have to go through some housekeeping instructions. But I wanted to start by saying that we hope we've answered many of the questions uh, based on the presentation that we've received into the city and we're building a frequently asked question page as Kelly mentioned. And so if we don't get to a question tonight or, or, or uh, I just encourage everyone to hit our website and go through that because a lot of energy and work been put into that. But we appreciate people may not have had a chance to review it so we can respond to those questions tonight as well. So if you're a member of the public, you can see you are participating as what Zoom calls an attendee. And your microphone and camera are currently muted. And if you're calling from a phone, you need to dial star nine to raise your Zoom hand. And for privacy reasons, Dina and Stephanie will be renaming your viewable phone number to the word citizen and using just the last four digits of your phone number just for the your own protection. If you have a question for the panel, you have to raise your hand in the Zoom format and our meeting host, which is Stephanie and Dina, will call on you one by one as we go down the list. Once you have asked your question, the Zoom host will lower your hand. We respectfully request that you use no more than two minutes, two minutes to form your question or questions. And please raise your hand once we can so we can respond to as many people as possible. I'd also ask that if you heard your question asked and answered, that you would lower your hand so we can again move through as many questions as possible. And we acknowledge we may not be able to answer all questions tonight, and if that's the case, you saw in Kelly's presentation, we have an email and phone number that you can respond to, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And then finally, we appreciate many people have an opinion 
or would like to make comments rather than ask a question. And we certainly understand that. We understand. We recommend that if you do want to make comments, that you do so during the public comment period at Tuesday's city council meetings or write city council at srcity.org so the full legislative body can have the context of what you want to say rather than just this group tonight. So, uh, and depending on how long we go um, and how many questions are queued up, we'll see if we need to take a break or not, but why don't we just get started and I guess I turn it to you now, Dina, are we ready to start hearing questions? We are, thank you, Dave. Uh, the first person in the queue is Aaron Hogland, um, part of the pronunciation. I'm enabling your permissions, Aaron. Please unmute your microphone. Oh, am I Aaron, are you live on the line? I should be. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And oh. now you should have a screen share of the screen. Oh, one moment, please. Take your time. Are you seeing the timer on your screen? I am. Okay, terrific. So I'm gonna start the timer and you can uh, present your question to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, essentially my question loops back to site selection. Um, and I understand it's probably a very complex process, um, but looking at uh, availability of um, resources, things along those lines, the Finley Center's fairly removed from a lot of county resources, um, Sonoma County Department of Health, things like that, that some other locations, maybe like a SRJC where they have ample parking space, um, surveillance on site, the blue light system in case of emergencies, a dedicated police force to the area, and being within easy walking distance of other medical facilities and uh, city services might be a good option and srjc is also closed right now and will probably remain closed well after the shelter in place order is lifted to allow time for cleanup and relocation so the question loops back around to why not a site that's more uh, centrally located and has all of those resources available including an on-site medical facility for training nurses Thank you. Okay, thank you. Question, Aaron. Did you have another one, or was that the primary one, site selection? That's that's the primary one. I okay. Well, I, I'll I'll um, bring it back. I mean, I, Kelly touched on it in her presentation. We looked at city resources first. We talked about the county fairgrounds and its potential use. We did reach out to the JC initially for about emergency shelter. They weren't quite sure at that space they were in, whether they would be resuming classes in a few weeks, a month. And again, in, it's an emergency, so we're moving as fast as we can. So I'll start with that, but maybe there's someone else on the panel who would like to contribute a response. No? So yeah, that, I would just say it's a, a speed issue and what real estate and um, opportunities the city had at its disposal in the moment. So thank you. Okay, the next caller uh, or participant we have to make a or pose a question is Jim. I'm enabling your permissions, Jim, to talk. Can you please unmute your mic? Yes, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Let me pop up the timer for you one moment. Great. Okay, the timer is up and I will start your timer now. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, how and how, who are the homeless folks that are selected for this Finley Center uh, encampment? And then the other question I had is what about the RVs that are still using West College and other streets in the city? How are those gonna be handled? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, maybe 
Jenny Lynn, you can take the, the how we're selecting folks and uh, uh, Kelly and I can talk about the vehicle matter. Yeah, great. So, um, so we are going to be screening individuals that are in our most densely populated encampments that are most in need of social distancing. We'll be, uh, which primarily right now is uh, in our downtown area. Uh, and so we'll be working with individuals living in those camps and first uh, triaging the individuals who are considered to be high risk of complications if they were to contract COVID-19. Hopefully work with them to get into one of the County of Sonoma's non-congregate shelter sites. And then for those by which that's not an option, we'll be working with them to get them into the Finley site. Uh, we're screening individuals who are uh, willing to go. It's a voluntary program at this point who are willing to come to the, to the site and those that are also willing to uh, follow program expectations and guidelines and work uh, work within the, the new community that will be established at the Finley site uh, to make the program successful. So that's that's our current selection process. Our uh, outreach team knows many of these individuals uh, and has been working over the last couple of days and will be continuing to do so to select individuals to this, uh, move into the site uh, beginning next week. So. Yeah, thanks, Jenny Lynn. And, and I, would, I would contribute that the focus is on folks living outside, cheek to jowl, a sleeping bag to sleeping bag, tent space to tent space, because this is a health emergency. Our evaluation of those in vehicles is perhaps there's a little bit better social distancing, but that's not to acknowledge we have an issue here in Santa Rosa. And so our discussions um, is to uh, sequence these steps again. If you recall back to the presentation, we first created distance in our shelters. We've then created hygiene matters within our known homeless encampments in partnership with the county. We then invited our most vulnerable high-risk folks into non-congregate shelter in a hotel room. We're taking this step in the moment for our unsheltered. And I see our next step is to have a discussion with our city council on options around what we see in vehicle encampments. And this is Kelly Kuykendall. I'll just add that um, we had started an evaluation of, of safe parking sites um, back in January following city council direction to look at safe parking. And so we recognize there's a need to create space for individuals living in their vehicles. And that analysis was underway before um, all of this happened with COVID-19. So that has been delayed a bit and I, we're anticipating bringing that information forward to um, the city council this summer, um, you know, unless it unless it, it becomes part of our COVID nineteen response, but it's not proposed at the Finley site. Yeah, thank you. Okay, moving on to the next question, uh, it will be from Diana, followed by Christina. Diana, I have unmuted or enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? I have. Thank you. Terrific, and the timer should appear on your screen. Are you ready to go, Diana? I am, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for this presentation. Uh, first off, I really appreciate the, the information that you've already provided. I have a number of questions that I think I'm gonna send through your website because I've got so many, but Basically, the question I really want to answer here in this forum is how can the, the citizens that live within the area of, this, of the Finley Center that walk there, walk their dogs and, and, and whatnot, how can we help make this uh, site a success? What, what can we do to ensure that the people who are living within this structure, this social distancing, um, are, well, I don't want to say happy, but how are they going to, what can we do to help, in other words? Yeah, thank you, Diana. Um, we, we talked about that a little bit at staff of, you know, Jenny Lynn, about how we accept donations. It might not be at the site, but uh, why don't you talk about what, what we uh, kind of covered a little earlier today. That would be helpful to start. Yeah, and thank you very much for um, for for saying that and, and wanting to to see how we can be uh, proactively working together on this uh, opportunity to make it successful. So, um, so we're again because the situation we're in, you know, cafeterias is historically in our homeless services operations relied on volunteers and 
and donors, but in a unique situation such as uh, spread of uh, COVID-19, we are limiting the number of volunteers that are involved in the program. We will have some needs. Um, and we will have needs for, you know, in-kind op options that people can bring. We'll be compiling a list to hopefully post on the city's website of items that we will be accepting uh, for, uh, to help with the residents as we kind of get in there, experience the operations and hear from the residents, what are things that we could be um, adding to enhance the experience there. So uh, that'll be kind of forthcoming after we kind of move people in and start bringing it in their perspectives from uh, what it's like to be in there and what things we could do to enhance. Um, I'll also say, you know, we helping to spread um, the information about this program and the, some of the things that were presented tonight is a really great way to help inform your community and neighbors that around what this will look like um, and how we want to be proactive and proactively engaged with the neighborhood and 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 spread positive and, and truthful facts around what's, what, what this will be and what this won't be. Um, additionally, if you have ideas as you're kind of experiencing and, and, and observing the site from, from your part of, of the town, please feel free to let us know. Um, you know, the, the city has set up the information to kind of create a, a channel and flow of information. And as the operator, you can also contact uh, myself, uh, I, I will be definitely open to hearing uh, concerns as well as uh, things that are going well. So um, I will make sure that we follow up with contact information and, and all of those things, and that'll all be posted as, as well on the city's website. And I think going to that frequently asked questions page is probably the the best funnel to learn uh, what what's truthful, what what we're doing, and and it's where we're going to keep most of the information up to date. Yeah, thanks, Jenny Lynn. Okay, the next question is from Christina. Christina, I'm enabling your speaking permissions and can you unmute your microphone? Yeah, thank you. Okay, your time starts now, thank you. Thanks, I too just wanna say uh, how much I appreciate this information. Um, I was coming to it rather indignant and then after hearing all of it, I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys have done so much work. It's really well thought out. Um, and I just appreciate that aspect of it. Um, considering that, like, I felt like a lot of times, like, the west side just gets kind of dumped on, and the east side, I mean, I've grown up here my whole life, I grew up on the east side, couldn't afford to live there, and now I'm on the west side sort of deal, right? So I came in really angry at first, like, once again, you know, our one part is being taken away, and blah, 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 and after hearing it, I feel like you've diffused a lot of that by showing how much you um, have really thought it out. My question is, what's the plan for after this of like how is this removal happening how will the police safety still be there in case you know people aren't moving i just don't want it to turn into sort of like a permanent homeless encampment um like no one wants that so awful even saying that but um but a park you know is not really where i want a permanent homeless encampment, if that makes sense. So I was curious, what's the plan for at the end of how everybody gets moved out and taken care of in a healthy, appropriate, kind way? Thank you for your question, Christina. That is exactly the discussion we're having. Uh, as a city, we have been trying to go through the logistics of making this um, safe social distancing program a success at Finley. And at the same time, talking about how we um, return Finley to a recreation center and a park and the parking lot for its intended use. And so we're looking at several options as a city. We call it our intermediate strategy. Once the shelter in place order is lifted, uh, restoring our shelter capacity. We're looking at a variety of options. I, I don't really want to go through a lot of those today. I'm going to visit with the city council on that. But I, I will just say that we, when I use the term restore our shelter system, it means that this is an 18 to 24 month uh, challenge, not that the Finley Center will be there that long, let me clarify that. But we separated the bunk beds at Samuel Jones Hall to have six feet separation, so we lost capacity. So we're looking at leasing property, we're looking at getting into a contract with a local camp to use their, uh, um, cabins because they recognize their business model has changed. We're looking at partnerships with the county and the whole concept of the indoor outdoor shelter, the path we were on before this crisis hit. Uh, we're looking at uh, ways to create uh, 
management efficiencies at Samuel Jones Hall. So we don't have a specific answer in the moment, but I just want folks listening and yourself to know that that work is going on so that when the shelter in place orders lifted, we can present some options for our city council. So thank you. Okay, the next question will be from Bonnie, followed by Judy and Rona. Bonnie, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you unmute your microphone, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Your time begins now. Yeah, uh, thank you guys for having this meeting. This is really helpful, and I appreciate all the great work that you've done um, and that you continue to do. I, I think that the Finley Center is a good site. I happened to walk down there the other day. I live on Trowbridge Street, so not too far away. And I walk down there a lot and it, it's, it's a small area. It looks like it's a very well thought out and marked out place. A Couple of questions and then I'll let you, um, I'll just let you answer these, whoever wants to. Uh, in the uh, Press Democrat last week, it was noted that Dr. Mays was not uh, aware that this uh, idea was being proposed. And I wonder if you have uh, since consulted with uh, Dr. Mays, our public health official. And also, is there going to be any um, uh, corona testing done at this site? Seems like a really great opportunity to do that. Uh, secondly, and pardon me if you've spoken about this, but I was late to the meeting. Um, are there going to be services offered to folks um, for substance abuse, mental health, um, any county or city services that might be uh, um, helpful to them? Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that basically covers it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie. I kind of heard a three-part question. Um, I don't know, Jenny, let maybe start with you about the, the testing opportunities. I can't remember in the presentation if we talked about St. Joseph's um, being at the, the uh, Safe Social Distance Center and the service review again. And then, uh, I don't know, T Tina, if you can speak to Dr. Mace, uh, it's right, I think we, we took her by surprise last week, but I think we've had a chance to co confirm the 12 foot separation meets the Centers for Disease Control. And it's all about social distancing, trying to keep the curve flat. So I don't, maybe start with you, Jenny Lynn. Yeah, so I'll talk, I can talk with Lee about the testing as well as the services offered. So, um, so we do have a partnership with St. Joseph Mobile Medical uh, Health. They've been fantastic in, in a lot of the work we've been doing at Sam Jones, as well as at the Sandman um, and other operations that we have in place uh, for individuals who are experiencing homelessness, um, both to do the testing as well as we are working with individuals who are symptomatic to get in access to their medical, their primary care provider and get tested if, if appropriate. So we have an entire protocol as we're doing screening, as well as ongoing monitoring of individuals who might appear symptomatic to get them to their medical care provider to get tested. So yes, we will be helping to facilitate that both on site as well as getting them to their primary care physician. Um, and if they don't have one, helping them establish a medical home so that they can get um, all, all those resources that are available to them. Uh, in terms of services, we will have on-site trained staff. We have a very experienced um, a group of individuals who've been working in this field for a, a very long time, and, and particularly in this community, our host team, who knows these individuals by names and have, has, has long-standing relationships with them. So they will be providing the continued services they provide in uh, our encampments, which includes access to uh, substance abuse and behavioral health treatment opportunities for individuals, as well as other services to help them with their needs, whatever they might be. Um, and ultimately our, our goal, and what we feel like is the biggest um, uh, preventative measure we could take is to actually get people housed. And so we will be continuing on uh, helping individuals uh, on their journey towards permanent housing as, uh, as a way to help them in this crisis as well as resolve their homelessness in the long run. So those will be uh, some of the services provided um, uh, as we continue through this, this program. And um, uh, I can't speak to uh, any specific conversations that Dr. Mace has had, but I can say that uh, perhaps she didn't initially know uh, about the Finley Center, but since then she does know. And, and absolutely this program uh, meets uh, the social distancing guidelines. It meets the health order. This is a great program and uh, she is absolutely aware. And we, we support what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Jenny Lynn. 
Okay, we'll move on. The next question will be from Judy, followed by Rana, and then Bruce. Judy, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Thank you very much. Um, I, I would also like to say that your presentation was excellent, and it's very clear how much work and thought you've all put into this. Um, having said that, I agree that being on the west side feels like a dumping ground sometimes, and given that all the homeless, most of the homeless centers and resources are on the west side, we have more homeless problems, encampments, et cetera, and we just got over the Joe Redota Trail, which was traumatic. Um, but um, what I wanted to say is there's long been, in my awareness, a he said, she said situation between the city council and the board of supervisors. I have heard from several city council members that uh, the Board of Supervisors want, won't allow use of the fairgrounds for this kind of thing. And the Board of Supervisors, um, I've, ta I've been in direct contact with Linda Hopkins and um, Tracy at Shirley Zane's office, and they both said that they're open to the use of the fairgrounds for this. So um, what, I, what I'm wondering about is why that situation wasn't considered, and I understand it only takes three of the Board of Supervisors to okay something like this. It seems like a far more appropriate place, especially since you're going to have to move everybody anyway. That's it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Um, earlier in the presentation, Kelly covered that uh, the County Board of Supervisors in March, I think it was March 11, provided direction to their staff to evaluate indoor-outdoor shelter locations which included the evaluation of the fairgrounds. Um, and they have the 10 trailers that are helping with the emergency response currently. I, I think, I don't want to just say it, but I, there, you have a comment in there, and I don't know if this panel is the best group to respond to that, but we can certainly pass that on to the city council. Or I, we encourage you to, to write city council at srcity.org or um, share your view at, at the public uh, comment period during a council meeting. David, if I can also just comment, um, this is Mayor Swedholm, and I've heard some of those same things, and it, you know, the he said, she said, I don't think you've ever heard that from me because I don't say that. We're building this relationship, working together for it. Is there some miscommunication? Because there's a tremendous amount of information going out there. I would just go to the source, you know, um, because those conversations, as Tina said, we have been in conversation, but sometimes not every, of, every one of our seven council members has all the information that the others may or may not have. So I can just stress that it is very collaborative of what we're doing here. I've had personal conversations with Supervisor Zane, Supervisor Hopkins. Those are ongoing. This is not just the first time we've ever discussed some joint city and county operations. So the spirit of collaboration is there. Is there... Could there be some room for improvement? Absolutely. But, but again, I don't want anyone to have the impression out there that it's a, you know, he said, she said, and we're not working very well together as evidenced by, you know, Tina's participation on this panel. And it's going to continue that moving forward. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, we will move on to a question from Rana, followed by Bruce. Rana, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Uh, please unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear uh, you. Thank you. I have a question about uh, where you're going to put all these homeless people that are in motels and other facilities when uh, the next evacuation happens and transportation also. That's it. Just worried about the next evac. <laughs> so if I understand your question, in, in, in case the the community has to evacuate for a natural disaster. How do we manage the folks that we're dealing with with this pandemic disaster? <laughs> yeah, well, basically the homeless people. How are you transporting them? And also, where are they going to go? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start with a response, and maybe someone else on the panel could um, jump in. As it gets back to what I described a little late earlier about our intermediate response. So again, for folks listening, the city has been in an immediate health crisis pandemic, trying to uh, help our homeless community and keep a virus from spreading through that community and our, our 
our, our greater Santa Rosa. This is one of the steps we're taking to do so to create better spacing within known encampments, keep folks safe with the tents 12 feet apart. The intermediate response is what I mentioned a few minutes ago, and that is to expand and restore our existing homeless service, the number of shelter beds, the number of resources we have to house people, whether it's through master leasing, rapid rehousing, that work is also underway. So I, I, I just want to, if we could think of this in terms of, we have an immediate response, and now we have an intermediate response, we're in an overlap period in the moment. I don't know if anybody else on the panel who's been involved in these discussions have anything to contribute. So Dave, if I could hop in, um, Jay, this is Jason Nutt. I'm the Director of Transportation and Public Works and Assistant City Manager. Um, you know, the concept of what happens during another natural disaster is one that we've taken into consideration throughout this entire process. Uh, we realize that, that this operation is occurring at the beginning of or right before we get into fire season. Yeah. And we don't know how long this disaster uh, or the pandemic is going to last. So in all of the steps, we've calculated what it's going to take for us to be able to continue to operate Finley as an emergency shelter for individuals who are having to leave their homes if we get into another situation like we did in 2017. Um, so uh, all of your concerns are things that we've been working through and we've been doing our best to ensure the stability of our community during the course of a subsequent or overlapping disaster. Um, from a transportation standpoint, uh, City Bus is providing services not only to, pro to help the individuals currently uh, experiencing homelessness underneath the uh, overcrossing and at uh, some of the other park locations move to this social distancing site, um, but in the event that we do have a fairly significant disaster, uh, as we did last year, um, where we actually had to evacuate folks out of Finley, um, City Bus will also be providing some services for those uh, individuals as well. Yeah, thank you, Jason, and thank you, Rhonda, for that question. Okay, moving on to a question from Bruce, followed by a citizen with a phone number ending in 5715. Bruce, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Bruce, are you there? Bruce, I still Bruce. see your hand raised. Are you there, sir? You might be on mute, Bruce. All right, Bruce, we are going to move on, but I'm going to leave your hand raised. Um, Hello, I'm unmuted now. I'm sorry. Okay, terrific. Okay, so your time starts. I was now. trying to do it in a different setting. Sorry about that. No problem. Well, I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate this meeting and everything else. As a uh, citizen that lives straight across from the Finley Center, and the reason why we did that is because we knew it was going to be for the uh, elderly, we had a, uh, going to have a nice center there for uh, uh, retirement people. My concern is of understanding of the security of the people inside that are going to be in the tents, but our security outside. Is there going to be a larger presence of police patrol around the area? I have noticed in the last year that there is more people uh, in the middle of the morning, you know, with our garbage cans out, digging out, uh, you know, for the recycle, understanding, you know, trying to get cans and bottles for, for money. Um, and, you know, it gets a little eerie. And, uh, you know, for somebody walking along with their dog alone and everything else, security is a main concern with us in our neighborhood around here. Is there going to be a larger police uh, security uh, patrol in the area? That's it. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce. I can answer that from the police department, and I can ensure you there will be a visible presence from the police department. And honestly, it's going to be a two-part strategy that you're going to have as uh, Catholic Charities is already entered in the contract with the security company. So you're going to have uh, visible security uniform presence on the site 24 seven that are going to be managing the inside of the site. And you're going to have a visible presence from Santa Rosa police officers who are going to be doing 
foot patrols of the area, making sure the surrounding neighborhood and park are safe and there are no issues and visible presence with their patrol vehicles. And then again, if there are any community concerns that come up related to crime in the area, we encourage uh, residents to call the Santa Rosa Police Department, report those issues to us, and we're gonna be responsive as possible. And then directly, I manage the uniform patrol officers. So if there are issues, I encourage you to please let me know and I'll be able to address those and um, make sure that there's a, ceiling, a feeling of safety in that community and we're strong partners in this and we want it to be a success for our city. Thank you, John. And thank you, Bruce, for that question. It's fair, security is key. Okay, moving on to citizen 5715. I'm enabling your speaker permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? Hi, I'm on a phone, so I don't have a mic. Can you hear me? You are loud and clear. Thank you very much, and I'll put your- Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to try to touch on things that I heard from the speakers. One of the first ones was somebody said they chose Finley because it has a large parking lot and because it's closed. That is not true. It has been open for residents to go walk or bike there for a while now. How are we going to be able to use and enjoy our park? Even before this camp has come, the people that have been walking there, I have seen no masks, um, not a lot of social distancing, people using the high touch areas like the picnic tables. How can we feel safe using our park? And why do they think that that area has a lot of a big parking lot because there are plenty of other spaces, including the fairgrounds that have much bigger parking lots, even across the street where there are, you know, county offices or city offices. Um, why did the people think that this is an appropriate use for a public park? And one of the other callers mentioned this is our only park in our neighborhood. It feels like a violation of the public trust. Will there be a list of everybody who decided to do this to us and our park so that in case we want to vote them out, um, is there going to be a list of, you know, responsible people on the website who made this decision? And the last question is um, the police officer had mentioned um, criminals being released from the jails and then started talking about this camp, please tell me that they are not allowing known criminals into our neighborhoods. So those are my questions. Thank you. No, thank you. And there's a few things in there, um, public safety, ma uh, management of the social distancing area. Um, I, I don't know, maybe John, you start and Ginny Lynn follow. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. And again, the, the key word today is this, the close collaboration, that we're going to be working closely with Catholic Charities. If there are any issues there, we're going to be responding to them, and we're going to be addressing any community concerns immediately. Uh, we are going to be working in conjunction with Catholic Charities. There won't be people who are uh, registered sex offenders, won't be in the site, and they're, they're going to have a process in place. Uh, our goal is to make sure that it's a safe area for our community. And... We're gonna be going there. The police department has been uh, going to parks. We've been heavy on the education because our goal is to educate the community on the rules of the shelter in place. And we'll be continuing to do that. We'll work with uh, Catholic Charities to make sure of any of the residents who are in that park that they're following the shelter in place guidelines. They're following the guidelines with uh, high touch areas. And uh, we're gonna be working closely with our partners to educate and keep everyone following those rules. Thanks, John. Yeah, and I will um, echo what uh, Captain Cregan mentioned. You know, we, as a, from the on site management perspective, as I described earlier, we will be uh, making sure that people are following the public health order, both uh, the shelter in place component around why we added the curfew. We'll also be adding, um, you know, oversight, making sure people have face coverings, making sure people are following the social distancing uh, guidelines and all of the other public health directives as a part of their participation in this site. Um, as I understand it, there will still be access to the park. Uh, we actually, uh, there'll be, you know, the individuals will be in with side of the site and uh, working to move themselves forward as we progress through this, uh, this uh, program. And so we will be making sure that public health directives are known and making sure that uh, they are followed. 
we do have the city we've been meeting several times a week. We will be continuing to do that. Um, in that includes our public safety uh, partners as well as uh, all the different departments in the city to continue to make sure that we're responding to homelessness overall uh, together as, and making sure that this site is being successful for the individuals living in it and the surrounding community. And that will continue to be a high priority, I know from our standpoint as an operator to get that feedback and to continue to evolve uh, this program to make sure that everyone is safe both in the site as well as around the site. Yeah, thanks, Jenny Lynn. Anything Indeed. else? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I can address the last part of how the decision was made. You know, I appreciate Kelly explaining the process. I think it's also important for everyone listening or uh, viewing this uh, to understand that the, the city and the city manager uh, designed basically three different task groups called COVID-19 task groups, because uh, there's a variety of things that city staff and electeds are looking at as we come out of the situation. One of them is our economic development uh, task group. Another one is community input and engagement. And the third one of which I am involved in is housing and homelessness. And so I also asked each council member or two council members to participate in each of those task groups. So on this task group, it's myself and um, council member Dick Dowd. And so staff had been doing some research and then we had a task group or a task force uh, meeting and both uh, Dick and I were in concurrent with concurrence with the recommendation of the Finley would be the most appropriate site given the totality of the circumstances that the city and the county and this community is dealing with. So that's how that decision was made. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question will be from Steve followed by Deborah. Steve, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your microphone? Steve, are you on the line and ready to go? Yes. Okay, Steve, please uh, start your question. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for doing this. Secondly, I'm coming from a very emotional place. Um, I'm dismayed at it being at Finley. I'm not against helping homeless. I want that to be really clear. But um, my neighborhood, I want to know, one of the questions I have is, how many of you live in this area? That's number one. And the other thing is that if you're going to test for COVID, are you testing them now before you move them in? Are you doing the rapid testing? What's going on with the testing? Because you could bring 10 out of those 70 people can come in infected and then you've got a whole group of people that are living in quarantine at Finley. And the other thing I want to say is I have two grandchildren that live in my home and a daughter. And my daughter works at the Indian Health Project. That means that her being able to walk around safely is kind of compromised during her lunch hour if she wants to get out. And I probably won't let my kids play in the front yard. Um, we're within a quarter mile of the park. And I don't feel safe going to Safeways now. We have two Safeways here. I will probably avoid those stores because I do not want to be have more possibility of being infected. I'm um, at high risk. I'm a senior and I have immune deficiency. So mine comes from a really emotional place. I could be crying right now, but I'm trying to keep it together with this. Um, but my main thing is, how are you going to protect us with the testing, it takes 14 days or it can take less, but if you're bringing people in that are already infected, then you've already infected the whole community. So that's my statement, my questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And maybe we start with uh, the selection process of how we're addressed, trying to reduce the densities of our existing encampments and the partnership with St. Joseph and their testing capacity. And then, of course, if someone does test positive, this is a socially distant 12 feet apart. So they would be, um, you know, they wouldn't be able to leave the encampment in that case. We'd be bringing services to them. But Ginny Lin, I'm sure you have some thoughts there. Yeah, so uh, I, I certainly uh, appreciate the question and, you know, want to say that the whole idea behind this site is to create a, a better safe situation for not only people living in our encampments, but the community, you know, as, it, as we keep people in densely populated encampments, the possibility of spread is even greater than if we were to go through 
what we're planning here, which is to have a socially distanced tents from one another. So, uh, so that is the entire impetus behind this is to create a safer situation uh, for the spread to be minimized if someone was to contract COVID-19. Um, as I mentioned, we have a pretty robust uh, safety protocol we've put in place at all of our facilities and operations. This would be following those same guidelines around all of the preventative measures we've taken. Um, that includes a two-point screening process. We'll be doing an initial screen in the field of anyone who might be symptomatic at all, as well as an on-site screening process, including taking temperatures of individuals before they come into the camp. Uh, for anyone who appears at all symptomatic or does not, uh, does not able to get through the screening process for uh, COVID-19, we will immediately isolate them and get them into a medical care provider to get tested. From there, there are partnerships that have already been established with the County of Sonoma to create uh, places for them to be until their test results come back. And when their test results come back and they're negative, they are then allowed to come into the site. So anybody who's pending a test and symptomatic would uh, be in one of these uh, other sites, isolation sites, until their test came back negative. And then we could work with them to come back to the site or to enter the site uh, if they were one of the selected individuals. So there are protocols that we've put in place that the County of Sonoma has put in place to make sure that individuals who are experiencing homelessness that are um, symptomatic and awaiting test results or are test positive for COVID-19 are isolated out of a communal congregate shelter. So those are already in place and we'll be continuing that practice in this, in this site. Good, good, thanks. And Dave, just because the caller asked who lives by there, um, and I, I'm the only one who I would, ex I don't expect anyone else to answer this, but as an elected official, I live on the west side of Santa Rosa and have lived on this side of town for over 30 years. So I'm definitely uh, a big user of Finley Park and I consider it one of our uh, community assets. And Jenny Lynn, yeah, don't you live over nearby? <laughs> I live, yes. Okay. Okay, the next question will be from Deborah, followed by Yvette. Deborah, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you unmute your microphone, please? Yes, um, I wanna first of all, thank you for uh, making these tough decisions. And I know there's no place that people are gonna feel totally happy with, but I understand why you pick this location. And I live about a half a mile away, so I do use the park a lot or have in the past. Um, it's not clear to me what, um, what the time frame is of how long this will be there. And it's also not clear to me, should the Finley Center reopen or the Aquatic Center reopen, will this um, uh, site still continue to be there? So I'd, I'd like some clarity of whether these are gonna coexist with each other or it, it'll leave once the other facilities open. So if you could provide clarity on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Deborah, thank you for that. And the time frame is really the, a key question. We don't know when the shelter in place order will be lifted or how. We do know that Finley will gradually be restored to a recreational facility. We do know that eventually there'll be swimming going on. And that gets back to our earlier comments of while this is taking place, we're also looking at the options of how we can uh, define this as temporary, and as we're standing it up, looking at our alternatives to stand it down, for lack of a better term. And by, what I mean by that is alternative space, whether it's restoring our shelter system to the number of bed capacity, looking at additional options, that's all under review currently. But I, I like you, uh, would like certainty in a time frame. I think we all would. Uh, and I know our recreation folks, Jason's here, the a lot of demand for the parks, leasing the space. Um, a lot of things have been canceled at Finley that haven't even been discussed about being restarted because we all are under this uncertain cloud of the time frame about when this crisis will pass and a shelter in place order will be theoretically lifted in a way we might have imagined previously. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the panel would like to add anything, but that's uh, what I would con contribute, okay. Yeah, Dave, uh, I'll just add that, you know, one of the one of the other aspects of this particular site is that um, coexisting with a recreation facility in the park, there's going to be a higher level of presence, not only from Catholic Charities, uh, but also from the police department. 
Uh, our whole intent here is to be able to try to find a way to coexist if we have to. Uh, so the recreation team is working very closely with this group uh, of, of professionals that you, that you see on the screen in an effort to try to come up with the most appropriate way for us to have those services active, operational, functioning for the community. At the same time, we're providing a safe social distance space for the uh, individuals uh, experiencing homelessness. Thanks, Jason. Okay, Dave, I just want to do a time check. If... Oh, uh, <laughs> so we've been at this for 90 minutes. I'll get, is there a way to tell how many more people have their hand raised? We have uh, 17 members of the community with hands raised. 17? Yeah. How's the panel? Are we good to go, or do you want to take a quick five minute? Okay, good to go. Let's keep rolling. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Yvette is the next question, uh, member of the community with a question, followed by Mara. Yvette, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Yvette, are you on the line? I am, thank you. Terrific. Please ask your question. Um, I just wanted to let you know that um, in 2005, my husband and I purchased a property directly across the street. It was abandoned. We turned them into two homes, and um, our tenants are very concerned. Um, my husband and I are both Bay Area firefighters, so unfortunately, we have a little bit of a jaded inside look of what really goes on in some of these encampments. But I do understand, and I'm very happy to hear the way that it seems it's being controlled, and so it's a different environment. Um, but obviously... Um, don't want to be as jaded, but we unfortunately are a bit. Um, my question is, is that there's an 8 p.m. curfew. Um, historically, that seems to be when things get amped up is around 8 p.m. So I'm wondering, um, are you going to be doing a roll call? Is there going to be if people don't show up by 8 o'clock and they still roll in? Um, how is that going to be looked at? Um, you know, we're talking tents and we're talking hot summer nights. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, are, are people going to be sitting in their tents and, you know, what's the noise level going to be um, after 8 p.m.? Um, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, the Catholic, isn't, the Catholic uh, Charities isn't going to be there. There's going to be security guards. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know, I've, you know what their personal interest is. Are they going to be keeping the noise level down? And, you know, are they going to make sure that people aren't roaming in and out past 8 p.m.? And um, if they don't make the curfew, then are they roaming through the neighborhoods? So um, I guess the question is, how is this 8 p.m. going to be looked at? And if they don't abide by it through this um, good neighbor contract, will they be removed from, the, um, from this uh, community? Yeah, thank you, Yvette. Sounds like operational questions there, Jenny Lynn. <laughs> yeah, there were a few in there, so I'm going to try to uh, try to write as fast as I could. But if I miss a couple, please feel free to follow up right. with me, or someone else remind me if I miss one. Um, so yeah, so the 8 p.m. curfew is is from a couple of different perspectives. Again, it's from the, the, a lot of it is due to the shelter in place order and the fact that you know travel should be around essential services, and and there isn't a lot of essential services happening after 8 p.m. at this point. Um, things will be continually evaluated in this program and, and operations. And if it, that is working well, we'll continue it. If it's not working well for other reasons or health directives change or the shelter in place order changes, obviously some of this might change as well. So the 8 p.m. curfew is one we will be doing a, a roll call, uh, not a roll call, but we'll be checking on how people are. It, it's also not just to protect the communities, also protect the individuals to make sure that if they aren't there, we're gonna do every attempt we can to contact them to make sure they're safe and something didn't happen to them during the day either. Uh, and so that's important for us to kind of also make sure that they, their whereabouts are, are safe and secure as, as, as much as the, the, the site that we're, we're operating in the surrounding community. Um, if individuals are not communicating with us and are not coming back to the site, they would be removed from uh, the program so we can make space for someone who is going to utilize the the program site so that would be part of the continued compliance to be in the be in the site and eligible for the program is to be fo uh, following the program expectations which at this point because of the shelter in place orders includes the 8 p.m. Uh, curfew so so that I think it covered a, a few of them there might be a couple I missed if I missed any please other panelists let me know and I'll I'll, I'll try to address those ones as well I also heard something about noise level, a concern about noise. 
Yeah, thank you. And and that reminds me. So security will be acting to make sure that all of the same uh, rules and regulations are followed. They'll be playing very much similar uh, role as the staff is, um, both you know on site and off. And so that is um, still going to be component even during the um, after hours of the 8 p.m. component. They'll be working to keep the noise down, working to make sure that um, all the program regulations are followed. So that will be the role of security. I just want to add one thing um, in that even though this is an outdoor shelter, unlike some of our existing shelters that are indoor programs, um, we have similar curfews and protoc protocols in place that are other shelters that are operated by Catholic Charities. So they're experienced with dealing with this sort of curfew monitoring and compliance um, with the new sh shelter in place environment that we're all living in. Thank you. Okay, the next question will be from Mara, followed by Judith. Mara, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic. Hi, thank you so much. You can fire away with your uh, question. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say, first and foremost, thank you so much for putting this uh, thoughtful presentation together and this plan. Um, it's clear that you've really taken a lot of community concerns into heart, so I appreciate it. Um, I have a comment and then I just have a quick question. Um, the first comment is I just want to respond to some of the concerns folks have around safety. Um, as somebody that works with, I work with healthcare workers across several hospitals here in Sonoma County and I live with a doctor. I just want to say one of the best ways that we can ensure our unsheltered community uh, are less likely to contract COVID is when we have uh, well thought out shelters that have bathroom facilities and hand washing facilities. So I just want to dispel any myths for folks that you're any more unsafe. You should continue to wash your hands. You should continue to stay six feet apart from folks when you're walking, regardless of whether they have a home or not. So um, I just want to say that your plan and your presentation is clearly taken into consideration those needed facilities. The question that I had is I heard you answer the question around the long term and you know post COVID or at least post this COVID thinking about moving people into housing. Uh, how can community members or uh, organizations help to support the city in thinking about long term and, and actually helping you start to relocate folks uh, over time? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mara. That's a fair question. Um, we, as a city, have been inviting the community to help us with this through several programs, primarily our, uh, our CHAP program, Community Homeless Assistance Program, because this is a big issue and we recognize it needs a partnership with the county, the other cities, and the community. And so as we get, we get closer to uh, forming recommendations for the city council, we would be liking to reach out to the community Hear, hear the ideas, get your feedback on, on some of the thoughts we have that I mentioned earlier, um, and then invent how this could help. Like we heard from Ginny Lynn earlier about donations and how to manage that for not just the uh, people that will be residing uh, at the Finley site, but our other shelter system. And I don't know, Mayor, if you would have anything you wanted to add to that. Well, for me, thanks for the question. Again, this is uh, Tom. The way I think a lot of people can help, talk to your circle of influence, especially if they're landlords that are willing to offer up uh, housing units. Uh, we've got a variety of different programs run through, at least the city run through Catholic Charities regarding master leases, um, and they can participate. So if you're a landlord and you want to try to help the situation, contact the city, contact Catholic Charities, and we have different programs that can assist to make this a win-win. Uh, and generally, do you want to talk about some of the master lease programs that really um, Catholic Charities manages the clients for the most part, which is, I think, a really advantageous situation? Yeah, and I, I appreciate this opportunity as well. I mean, just because we are, you know, it, it's been really important for us to make sure that we're taking emergency immediate action in this uh, safe socially distant site is is one of those actions. But uh, for us as an operator, and I know in several conversations with the city, this is um, just an, an, an opportunity to not only get people safe, but also to continue on our long-term goal, which is actually housing people. We have not stopped housing people. We are still working through our housing navigation and housing location process. And in many ways, our, um, our team has been housing people at rates higher than we have in the past. Um, 
for example, at our family shelter, we were able to place in one week six families out of the housing, out of the shelter and into permanent housing, no longer, you know, resolving their homelessness. And so that is a continued effort that will happen still in this site. Uh, is making sure people have access to housing. Um, and we're very grateful that the city of Santa Rosa has offered us several opportunities uh, to increase that housing from a creative perspective with two different programs. One is our, our rapid rehousing program where we actually work with landlords in the community to help house individuals and help subsidize the rent and provide in-home case management we also have a master leasing program that the mayor mentioned around uh, Cavaturi is actually leasing a, a unit from a landlord and then subleasing it out to some of the individuals we're working with. It's been a great effort uh, to allow us to provide housing for some individuals that maybe wouldn't be considered around it. And Cavaturi comes in as the property manager and working with the individuals to keep the property safe and to make sure that all interests are, are protected, the residents as well as the landlords. So uh, we have a robust landlord incentive program that the city funds for that, which includes a risk mitigation pool. If anything happens to the unit, we're able to cover that from a damages perspective, um, as well as other sign-on bonuses that we work with landlords to, to help us uh, make sure that our most vulnerable individuals are housed. And as I mentioned earlier, for us, housing is the best preventative measure we can take for people experiencing homelessness in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, the next question will be from Walden, followed by Kathy Kay. Walden, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay. I've got um, a few questions. Uh, so I noticed this meeting was being recorded, and so will the recording be posted somewhere? And then the second question I had was, is the Sandman full, or is it only for high-risk individuals? And if this site is filled, it, are, are there going to be alternative sites? And those are the only questions I have. Okay, well, I hear, I hear three of them as the, uh, this meeting is recorded and will it be posted? I think the answer to that is yes, Dina. Or... Yes, we'll have it, um, it, it is being recorded. We'll pull it off the cloud and um, determine where, to, where the best access for the public will be to put it. I don't know if that will be on the homeless web page or on the city clerk's page, but um, we'll make it available as soon as possible. Then regarding the Sandman, that is the non-congregate shelter location where we moved our most high-risk folks that were sheltered and unsheltered in our community over a month, two months ago. All those rooms are not full. We have 77 people there, Janina, not, uh, that's if I recall, yeah. And then I think your question, Walden, was if this site fills up, what's next? This, and I'll start that, maybe Kelly, you can help as we, Remember, the goal is this is health and the emergency of COVID-19, and we're trying to lessen the density of our known encampments in Santa Rosa. And most of us on the call know that, you know, that's under the 101 freeway, Doyle Park Drive, Fremont Park, primarily in those areas. And so by inviting folks uh, and keeping them safe in this location, our outreach team will be encouraging and coaching folks in the known encampments to separate better. Uh, and earlier in the meeting, we talked about how we placed hand washing stations, portalettes and trash enclosures near these encampments. And so that's the whole goal of this immediate response is just the health and safety matter. Um, anybody else wanna contribute something in our immediate response for? Yeah, well, well, I want to go back to the question about posting the information. I got a text um, from our city PIO while you were asking that question that it's going to be posted tonight because she's so fabulous. And an e-blast will go out um, tomorrow morning letting people know where exactly to find it. But I imagine it's going to be where we've putting, been putting everything else homeless related right now. Um, if you want to sign up for the e-blast, you can do sr srcity.org slash news. Um, and then I would just, I just want to mention again, as I did in the presentation and echo what Dave was saying is that this is really about emergency response right now related to COVID-19. And we acknowledge that there are more people out there than we have shelter for, whether it be in our existing shelters or the Finley site. And that's something that we're continually 
evaluating. Thank you. So Adrian's watching, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. The next question is from Monty, followed by Diana Bell Kerr. Monty, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your microphone. Okay, thank you. Terrific, you're good to go. Okay, I wanted to thank everyone for uh, this presentation and the opportunity to um, ask questions. Uh, mostly I have two questions and they've sort of been touched on. Um, it was mentioned that um, this uh, encampment is intended to uh, get high risk individuals socially distanced. And uh, it was also stated that other high risk individuals have been housed in hotels. So I was wondering what the difference is. Why do some people get hotels and some people are given this <clears throat> encampment as an option? And then my second question is, um, if the individuals that are participating in this program are free to come and go um, and, you know, they're not really held accountable to social distancing measures, what, what's the point? What is the point of doing this? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mani. Um, I have a, a couple points here. The... Um, Maybe we start with the outreach, Jimmy Lynn, about the offer to transfer folks into the portal for the Sonoma State placement and so forth. Yeah, um, so so just to kind of clarify, we, the first point we're doing is, is we're reaching out to the encampments that are the most densely populated and most in need of social distancing. Um, and from there, we're first triaging individuals who are in that considered the high risk category, uh, which is people over the age of 65 and with some of the chronic medical conditions um, like respiratory illnesses and so on and so forth that put them at high risk of complication if they can uh, contract COVID-19. Um, for those individuals, uh, there has been a process set up through the County of Sonoma and, and Tina is on the call. I'm sure she could probably speak to it much more eloquently than me, but um, we're working to do the go through the referral process to get them into one of the what's considered non-congregate shelter sites, which is uh, the hotel that was mentioned, but also at SSU, which was also mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, the reason why those individuals are getting into non-congregate, more isolated, is because we're trying to keep people who are high risk, similar to the public health order around people over the age of 65 and people who have chronic medical conditions, stay isolated in your home, limit your, your, you know, your communal uh, interactions. These individuals don't have a home and don't have the ability to isolate, which is why this non-congregate shelter was set up. So that's the purpose behind first triaging people into there. Now, if for some reason a uh, non-congregate shelter is not op an option for somebody who's considered high risk or somebody who is not high risk that doesn't qualify to get into uh, a non-congregate shelter, that's what this site will first be, uh, will be set up for, is for those, those populations to be able to do social distancing. Um, in terms of the secondary uh, question, I think I heard in there about people, you know, being free to come and go and people uh, not following uh, public health guidelines. That, that's actually the entire purpose behind this site is to follow the public health guidelines. And as the operator, we will be making sure people are first educated around this, as well as following all of the public health guidelines, um, including face covering, social distancing, and all the other preventative measures that have been uh, asked of us um, by our, our officials um, who are protecting us in this pandemic. So that will be something we'll be doing. We will be having a sign in and inside out process again to make sure that um, we are helping make sure they're safe um, and also to encourage essential services travel only. So that that is all protocols we have put in place and will be continuing to operate not only at our other facilities, but also at this site um, as we continue. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Diana, followed by Jen. Uh, Diana, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic. Good evening. I wanna say thank you first and foremost to everyone for um, the wonderful work you've been doing and the way that you are uh, handling all of our questions this evening. I'm a neighbor of Finland Center, I swim there and currently I'm, I'm running over there. Um, I live on Trowbridge 
And my initial question, I think, has been answered, and that was one of how can we encourage other neighborhoods to to welcome these encampments to keep everyone safe. And my second question, uh, I think you may have just answered, Jenny Lynn, which is basically how how can I, as someone who's wearing a mask and walking or running or biking, um, is there anything that you would like to encourage us to do or not do for our new neighbors here at the park? Thank you, Diana. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so uh, I'll dive into that one. Um, uh, so thank you for that op the opportunity to kind of answer that question. I think uh, similar to what we're going to be holding the expectations of the individuals living in this site, uh, you know, we, we want the rest of the community to do so as well as they're kind of visiting the park and running or walking or whatever might be ne ne next to this site. We're here to not only protect the community, from uh, the, the spread of COVID-19, but also the individuals in this site. Um, there has been some recent research that shows that people who are experiencing homelessness are three to four times more likely to have severe complications if they contract COVID-19, um, not only because they don't have the um, ability to self-isolate and have access to certain hand-washing stations and things that we all might, that are, you know, that are housed, um, but also just the underlying medical conditions that is um, higher, is found to be higher among the homeless population. So we're trying to protect them as well. So continuing to follow your best practices around wearing masks and following all the public health guidelines is, is very much encouraged as well. Um, lastly, I will say, um, you know, we are going to follow up with some opportunities for people to help with um, potentially in-kind donations uh, for the site. I can tell you right now what's probably going to be on the top of that list is going to be face coverings um, and other hygiene supplies that will keep us well stocked uh, at the site. Uh, we are working with several vendors. The city of Santa Rosa has actually provided additional, a lot of additional support for us to make sure our shelters are safe and fully stocked with these items. But we are also relying on the community, especially in the area of face covering. So I know that'll be a number one uh, request we will have and we'll uh, continue to update that list and, and let people know how they can be a part of this uh, program, uh, uh, making it successful as well. Great, thanks. Okay, the next question is from Jen Herman, followed by Joanne. Jen, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? Hi there, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes, thank you. I just wanna echo all the gratitude that's been opening up these great questions um, tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm a nurse practitioner here in the community and I care for lots of people experiencing homelessness. And first, I just wanna know how I can refer them to this program. And two, in listening to several of the questions um, from neighbors who are very emotional and very, um, how can I say, I don't know, dehumanizing toward people who are experiencing homelessness. I feel like there's this re-traumatization that's happening in the way that we talk about people who are experiencing homelessness, that we're not seeing people without houses as our neighbors, that people are viewing them as other and as really less than human in a way that I find deeply troubling. And so how can we protect the people in this Finley program from the negativity negative attitudes, hostilities, and even possible violences done to them by this surrounding neighborhood attitude. Thank you. An interesting question. I, I wonder if you have an idea before we drop your hand or maybe we did already. <laughs> oh yes, I'm here. Um, oh. One idea would be a, a public um, service announcement kind of campaign with um, sharing stories and just humanizing people with faces and giving examples of ways people can um, be kind and be neighborly and really um, not having a, a societal intolerance of these, of these attitudes and just calling it out and naming it and having a zero tolerance for it really in all settings, especially for county meetings like this. Okay, thank you. Any member of the panel have anything to contribute? To yeah, I, I'd like to say something. Um, you know, oftentimes I think we, we don't do enough to tell the story. And I think it's important um, for us to even tell the story of, of you know, some good things that came out of these emergencies. You know, we're, we're often always in emergency mode and work mode and 
uh, you know, and, and it's great. We do great work, but I think it's also important to talk about the successes and tell the story of those successes and, and what happened when someone was connected to services while they were in uh, one of our programs or while they were in a non congregate setting. So I think it's really important that we, you know, take time to share these stories with our communities. And I think that also helps to dispel these neg negative attitudes. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, I appreciate that opportunity. And I, I certainly understand the, um, you know, all, all the concerns from all different perspectives. And, uh, you know, know that a lot of the individuals that we've worked with during this uh, kind of pandemic and disaster have actually been some of our biggest uh, volunteers and support in at least our shelters. Um, for a lot of it has been education. Um, they, not, not everyone that's living in the experience of homelessness has access to media and the, the, the information that we might have. And so as we've been educating them, a lot of them have proactively you know, helped clean our shelters, helped you know, make sure that their peers have hand sanitizers, make sure that people are following proper you know, coffee protocols, like all of these things that has actually enhanced our um, the community of the operations that we have, and we uh, hope and, and you know experience will continue at this site um, in the similar way it has in our other operations. And I think in terms of you know what we can do is you know help us as operators and you know let us know when there's concerns, let the city know when there's concerns, so that we can continue to evolve and and make sure this program is successful for the people in it and for the community surrounding it. Um, and, and help spread, you know, the, the facts that you're learning here tonight and point people to the website and when they have questions. You know, for us, a lot of it is, um, is, is making sure that the misinformation is uh, corrected and we, we have a feedback loop to help us be better. We also have a feedback loop to the community around what we are trying to do and what we are trying to accomplish and, and what this site and management will look like and, and how the people are actually oftentimes um, some of our, our, our most active participants in trying to make things safe. Yeah, we talk sometimes in our meetings about good, new, good news stories and to Tina's point, we're so busy responding to the situation at hand, we, we should be more conscious of taking the time to tell the good story like you just described. Thank you. Okay, the next question will be from Joanne, followed by Mio. Joanne, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, I have. I live nearby and am concerned. Uh, I'm concerned in regards to how the, uh, the, I'm not concerned about the people that will be in the uh, sheltered area at Finley, but they obviously will be having friends and associates nearby. And I'm wondering how the safety and cleanliness will be kept up in the playground area for children and also along the creek trails that many of us who live here use regularly. And by cleanliness, I mean like used hypodermics and increase. Uh, when the Bredota Trail was here, there was a few fires and increased rat problems. And just that that is also being addressed for us who live here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joanne. And, and um, you know, I'll kick it off about the, the distinction between a managed space and a non-managed space and what Ginny Lynn talked about earlier, uh, the, uh, the conditions to be a good neighbor, to um, be a part of the safe social distancing area. Um, so again, thank you, Ginny Lynn. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll start off, I think there were a couple of different things that maybe um, public safety wants to also address. Um, so just from our perspective, we will, again, we, we have our on-site operations. We also have our on-site security. Uh, we also are funded and um, through the city of Santa Rosa and through other uh, uh, funding sources to actually uh, do what we call the conservation crew. Uh, our conservation crew is where we actually pay individuals who are experiencing homelessness and trying to actively get out of it. We actually give them stipends to help us do cleanups of our surrounding communities. And that's something we're happy to put in place here to do extra uh, work in the Finley um, 
park um, and even pay individuals who might be living in the site to help them get some income and to help them towards their steps towards housing and also make sure that the surrounding you know, park is also safe and secure. So that's something we can definitely put in place through um, our existing uh, program uh, for this particular site. So I think that's to address the cleaning component and then in terms of the surrounding neighborhood, you know, we do have the good neighbor procedure where we will be um, making sure that people are um, being a good neighbor while they're there, which includes, um, you know, anything that might cause a negative deterrent into the community and also um, to protect the other individuals in this site. Again, we, we want to be very clear. This is all, this is also about keeping these individuals safe as well. So that's, that's the dual balance we, we play. So that will be part of our role as an operator and a manager. And then I'm not sure if public safety wants to address um, uh, around the other concerns that were, were brought up. Yeah, I think both Mike and I can talk to this from our perspective agencies, but certainly the police department, like we talked about, will be making proactive extra patrol in that area. Things like you brought up hypernervic needles. We work with Rec and Park and we'll be making sure that uh, any of that area is cleaned up. If we were to see any of that, then we're going to make sure it's safely disposed of. And the important thing is let us know. We're going to be as responsive as we can and be proactive, but we want to hear from the community. If there's concerns, contact the Santa Rosa Police Department. If you don't get the level of service that uh, you're expecting, then call me directly and I'll deal with it and I'll make sure that you are getting that and that we're working one-on-one -on -one with the beat officers in that area. And then uh, Mike can talk directly with some of the proactive work the fire department will be doing in that area related to the fire hazards you brought up. Yeah, I would just echo both what Captain Cregan and Jenny Lynn said and, and believe that being in a supported and managed encampment or camp is going to be a large benefit um, from the folks that are in encampments that are spread throughout the community, which honestly do have some inherent fire danger, whether it be from cooking fire or warming fires or, or other activities that are taking place. Um, but as uh, we move into fire season, we're aware of that, that danger. And, um, you know, we'll take each case on a case by case basis, evaluate um, the individual case and, and take appropriate action to mitigate any of the hazard that, that we find there to, um, to remove that hazard. So, um, as Captain Cregan said, reach out to the, the fire department. Um, obviously, if it's an emergency, dial 911 and we'll respond out directly to handle the situation. And, and I'll, I'll add on the maintenance side, while, while we did do our absolute best to try to protect our staff during the shelter in place early on, um, we have started to restore some of our maintenance services back into the city. Uh, we're working about half capacity right now, but we are focusing in on these very uh, important safety areas to try to bring them back up to uh, the conditions that they were pre-pandemic. Uh, pre uh, and so as, as uh, Captain Cregan mentioned, that's something that we're going to be working very closely with uh, the police office, as well as the staff that Jenny Lynn has out at the site uh, to make sure that we're addressing conditions out in the park, out in the parking lot, uh, on the tennis courts, or all along the creek trail as needed. Uh, so just wanted you to know that, that uh, the maintenance teams are also um, being restored and starting to get back to work. Good point, Jason. Thanks, everyone. The next question is from Mio, followed by Pissed About Finley. Mio, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute yourself? I did. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate Ms. Rivera's and the previous nurse practitioner comments. These are our unhoused neighbors. They deserve compassion and respect. I'm very glad that the city of Santa Rosa has decided to stop the uh, uh, bulldozing of homeless encampments and recognize in the middle of a pandemic, we have a health emergency. Uh, knowledge is power. Information is power. And I'm wondering, uh, I have some questions regarding just the informational uh, issues with the unhoused in uh, Santa Rosa. First, was Dr. Mays invited to this meeting? We're the largest municipality in the county, and I think we deserve to have a county health official be here to answer questions in regards to the pandemic. Uh, number two, what is the total cohort of unhoused people in the city? Second, I'm uh, third, excuse me, <laughs> sorry. Uh, how many of the unhoused cohort have been tested for COVID-19? Of the m number that have been tested, what percentage is positive? These are all issues I think the community needs to know. Uh, and again, uh, 
when we look at the statistics in the county and nationwide, uh, minority populations, and this is getting a little outside of the, uh, the uh, era issue of the homeless, minority populations in particular have a much higher uh, uh, incidence of COVID-19 than their representation in the community. And the, the uh, county health officer has just published some information in the last couple of days that shows that to be true with the Hispanic community in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. Have, have Hispanic uh, members of the community, has there been a, is there a testing regimen to address this? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mio. There, there's several questions there that might be broader than our efforts at Finley. I, I do know that Dr. Mace holds press conferences several times a week. Uh, maybe Tina, you can, do you know the schedule of that so he might be able to tune in or we can certainly refer him to that? Uh, I do not know the schedule offhand, uh, but I, I can address your question regarding the Latinx community. Uh, we do have a um, testing schedule for our Latinx community. Uh, actually, it's a fairly robust testing schedule. Uh, we'll be doing um, robust uh, outreach, uh, actually uh, targeting our uh, Latin communities this Saturday. We are, um, and, and ongoing. So absolutely, we're partnering with our um, um, Latin providers and, and others within the community uh, to uh, push um, education, um, our social distancing uh, education and things like this uh, into the community. So absolutely there's a, a push for that. Um, but it, as far as her schedule, uh, I can uh, circle back with you about that. I, I don't know, but I, I, she, did, she is on schedule. I want to say it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I don't have those times for you. Uh, you can call our office, our PIO communications office and, and, and get that information. Yeah, I just called it up to you, Tina. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 3.30 oh. on Facebook. And I think Jenny Lynn, or sorry, Kelly, you had the homeless count numbers. Did you, were you just able to pull it up? Yeah, I just, usually this is fresh in my mind, but uh, we've been busy with other things right now, so I just pull it up on the internet. And so we have in Sonoma County, there's about um, 3,000 people, uh, persons experiencing homelessness on any given day, and this is based on our point in time data that we do every year. This is a 2019 count. Um, about 2,000 of those individuals are unsheltered and 1,000 of them are sheltered. So when I say sheltered, that means living in a homeless shelter like Sam Jones Hall or Family Support Center or some of the other emergency shelters we have in the county. For Santa Rosa, we have about 1,600 individuals experiencing homelessness. Now, the breakdown on um, sheltered versus unsheltered, we have about, let me just make sure I'm looking at the right number here. For um, 2019, we had about 700 uh, sheltered and about 950 um, unsheltered. So I'm just answering the question about the, the, the unsheltered um, cohort. And I don't have data on what testing has been available for that population. Thank you. Oh, Dave, let me just add, this information's on our website, srcity.org forward slash homeless. Um, we have a fabulous homelessness solutions page, and on that there's data, including links to the 2019 homeless count. The 2020 count should be up there this summer. Good information. Okay, the next question is from Pissed About Finley, followed by Marcy. I have enabled your speaking permissions. Can you please unmute your mic? I believe I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Terrific. Get loud and clear. Fantastic. Thank you. So first, a bit of commentary and then a couple questions. Um, I live here in Santa Rosa. I've been here for a decade. I've lived in Sonoma County for multiple decades. It's heartbreaking watching the decline that's happening around here. I work throughout the Bay Area. It is heartbreaking watching the decline of civilization, watching... Um, the tent cities spring up, the trash that comes with that uh, in so many different ways, right? It's very difficult for all of us to see. There are a lot of people, I think, that are looking out for these homeless people and these addicts and these mentally ill people. 
trying to find help for them. Um, I think that the big disconnect that's happening, not only within the county here, but elsewhere, is in lumping homeless people in with the mentally ill. Uh, moving on to questions. I'll try and keep these concise and precise, but uh, there's a number of questions here. Tonight, I hear a lot of information indicating uh, there'll be an increased police presence down at Finley. Uh, what frequency of patrols are we talking about? Um, indicating a call to Santa Rosa Police Department should be made if lawlessness is observed. My question would be, how will these services differ any more than uh, the lawlessness that is taking place underneath every overpass on Highway 101? Um, the people living in Finley during the shelter in place order is supposed to be filtered. We're going to filter out the sexual predators, the criminal, um, sexual criminals that are there. What are we going to do about the rest of these sexual criminals that are running rampant underneath every one of these other overpasses over at Doyle Park and all these other. And then. Lastly, I'm not having a whole lot of confidence, you know, in this evening's dog and pony show. Um, what's different now than what has taken place and how the city has responded to these same issues in Santa Rosa over the last three to four years? Okay, I think I heard four part questions. Police patrols, what's different than the 101? Um, sexual criminals and what's different now? Uh, I can go in reverse order. What's different now, I would contribute for your consideration is that we're under a pandemic crisis. We have uh, guidelines from the Centers of Disease Controls that we can't uh, disperse encampments or offer folks an alternative because those alternatives are very tight right now. We're trying to keep people safe and stop the spread, not just within the homeless community, but our own broader community. And maybe, uh, John, can you speak to some of the police patrol questions? Absolutely. I appreciate the question. And, and, and I think we all feel some of the frustrations that we're seeing some of the visible uh, homeless encampments growing and the underpasses and throughout the city. And we're working closely with our community partners to address some of those. But the big difference is what David touched on right now. We're in the mandated pandemic response right now. And that has some limitations for the safety of our full community. Now, talking about the extra patrol, the, our, our city is divided into nine different patrol zones, and this is patrol zone uh, five that uh, the Finley Center is gonna be in. We have a dedicated beat sergeant who manages those officers. And if you go to the Santa Rosa website, it has the beat lieutenant's uh, name, it has the beat sergeant's name, and actually you can, you can email each one of the beat, the nine beat officers who work that. And I encourage you to reach out to them but well, we've already launched a beat project for this, and it's going to be each week I'm going to be meeting with those supervisors, talking to them about the progress, uh, going through any community concerns that have come in and making sure that we're being as responsive as possible. So you can email us directly or you can go to that website and email any one of those supervisors. But we're going to be closely monitoring that area. We'll be responding to any criminal complaints in that area. And the citywide pandemic response is evolving. As we, as a nation, go through uh, the COVID response, some of these guidelines are gonna start loosening up. We're gonna be able to start following some of our patterns that have been quite successful of addressing these large encampments. And we have a process in place that our city partners come together on a weekly basis and a process called HEAP, the Homeless Encampment Action Plan that you guys can see on the website that uh, Kelly has talked about. And we have a comprehensive pro, uh, plan to address these large encampments, work with our city partners to address them. And as soon as we're legally and safely able to start addressing some of these other encampments, we will do so. And I want to encourage you to keep sending us the emails, letting you know about the problems, and we're gonna do our part to address them. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Okay, the next question is from Marcy, followed by Kathy. Marcy, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic. Okay, can you hear me? Loud and clear, please ask your question. All right, um, first of all, I wanna thank you all for hosting tonight's presentation. It's been very informative. Um, I have a lot of empathy for the tax paying residents, especially those on Doyle Park Drive 
who are constantly dealing with problems associated with the unhoused people that are residing on Doyle Park Drive currently. Um, for example, there's a lot of middle of the night fighting, um, lots of garbage, hypodermic needles, dangerous animals, human feces. Um, this is a family neighborhood and a lot of kids are exposed to this on a daily basis, which is very disturbing to me. So my question to you is, um, will the unhoused people that are residing on Doyle Park Drive be required to go to Finley, the encampment? Thank you. Okay, I can start us off the, um, uh, this whole response to the pandemic and to lessen the density of our known encampments. Certainly we're very much aware of Doyle, Doyle Park Drive and we can talk about some actions taken there, but it isn't a requirement. This is, this is a voluntary request to reduce the density of our known encampments. I would note that Finley Center is gonna be managed as we've talked about. Um, Doyle Park Drive is, is um, currently well known to the police department, but we don't have uh, social workers or housing navigators are there 24 seven. So it, uh, the short answer is, is this is a voluntary program, not a required program to clear a, a complete encampment to another location. I don't know, John, if you have anything to contribute from what's been going on and your responses out there recently. Well, I can let you know the Doyle Park when we're very well aware of it. And I was actually out there today uh, driving in and our, we had our downtown enforcement team. We have six officers and a sergeant that are dedicated solely to address some of the issues, not only in the downtown core throughout the city related to homelessness. That team was out there in Doyle Park today, and it's a two-part strategy. We're doing some outreach and working with Catholic Charities, and actually today was a success. From my understanding, from talking to the sergeant, two of the homeless residents there on Doyle Park were actually put into housing today through our partners with Catholic Charities. And also some enforcement action was taking for some criminal behavior today. And two people were also put in jail today by that downtown enforcement team that were there. But honestly, Doyle Park is one of the biggest examples why we need a managed encampment. So that's the big distinction. Doyle Park is not managed. There are some issues. Finley Park is going to be managed and it's gonna be a whole different landscape as a result. So I think that's a critical distinction for us to understand of managed versus unmanaged. But understandably Doyle Park and some of these areas need some attention and working within the parameters of our pandemic response. The police department is out there and you saw some progress today, but undeniably more progress needs to be done and will be done in the next coming weeks. And we'll be out there with Catholic Charities making it a priority to voluntarily get people from the Doyle Park area and the underpasses to move over to the managed uh, campsite. Yeah, and I'll just um, also follow what Captain Cregan mentioned that we have been out there. We are working to house people and find the right um, option for them. Uh, you know, everyone has a different pathway. And so that's why sometimes it, it doesn't happen immediately. But Doyle Park is one of the areas we are going to be continuing to reach out to and uh, look for placement into the, uh, the safe, safe social distance site. Thank you. Okay, the next question will be from Kathy Kay, followed by Judith. And then the last hand at this point that is raised is Teresa. So Kathy, I've uh, enabled your speaking permissions and can you unmute your mic? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I just wanna say also, thank you all not, thank you all for your public service and every day is a a different circumstance with this virus. So I appreciate that you're trying to protect the community as a whole. Um, and I would just, um, my question then pertains to, uh, it's kind of changed through this call because some of them have been answered already. Um, but the, and I'm looking at my notes here, <clears throat> Um, what happens if you have few willing participants to leave their uh, current situation? Um, I know because of mental health issues and or substance abuse issues that many of these people don't want to follow strict guidelines. 
and they're just happy right where they are. So if you end up getting, you know, and maybe that's not going to be the case, hopefully, but if you say get a dozen people to sign up, is that going to maybe cause you to reconsider the site as a whole, that it wouldn't be cost effective to maintain it? Because just prior, somebody mentioned that this is a these are voluntary efforts and you're not required to be, um, well, you can't disband current uh, encampments. I understand that. Um, and then also I just would like to uh, have you consider uh, making that nighttime curfew higher so that more people aren't locked out of the uh, campsite. And lastly, um, just an FYI, just a week ago, um, uh-oh, time's up, but let me just finish that the um, drinking fountain outside the uh, tennis courts there is operational. And I just read, got another update on the city's website that said, as you open up parks all over, you will not be, uh, the drinking fountains will not be operational. So just that's an FYI. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And so we understand when you make a statement of a higher curfew, you mean later into the evening instead of eight o'clock? Yes, if okay, you can still you. hear me, yeah. So you raise a good point. What if there's few willing participants where this week we're doing the outreach? Maybe Jenny Lynn, you can give us a status on what your team is seeing and hearing. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, Jason, you might want to comment on the drinking fountain, but let's start with that. Yeah, so in terms of uh, the outreach that's already been done and as well as the curfew, you know, the curfew is, again, a lot of it is correlated to the shelter in place order, um, trying to keep both the individuals in the site safe as well as the um, surrounding community and be in alignment with the fact that travel should be for essential services at this point. Um, and so we we're, will continue to evaluate that as the, the health directives of, uh, it continue to evolve and as the program site continues to evolve, if it becomes something that is a barrier to service um, or, you know, again, things change, then, then we'll continue to look at that and keep the community updated uh, through the, the city's website and the frequently asked questions. Um, as it relates to the engagement that we've already done, we've already, um, just with the, what uh, has been announced in the public, we've already had several inquiries of people who want to come to the site. Um, and we today uh, were, did our first big uh, outreach effort into some of our more dense encampments, and we already have 22 individuals screened and selected uh, for the site, and that's just on day one of kind of this initial uh, placement uh, outreach. So we'll be continuing to do that um, we're, and uh, transitioning people over uh, beginning next week. Um, in terms of, you know, if the site doesn't become full, that, that would be maybe more of a policy discussion or something from the city's perspective, but our, our goal is to fill the site and keep people safe. Um, our, our you know, from the work we do with the individuals, they want to be safe just like everyone else during this pandemic. And so, um, you know, having access to things like restrooms and hand washing stations and socially distanced tents is a way for a lot of them to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, they, they want to be safe too. So uh, that's, that's our hope is to provide that option for them. And the meals as well, right? Yeah. Yes, and the meals, yeah. And I'll just add, thank you for the information about the, the drinking fountain. I'll have uh, maintenance go take a look and see uh, whether or not this is something we can manage. Um, and so we'll, we'll get on that as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Judith, followed by Teresa. Judith, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute yourself. Hello, um, I'm a 75 year old woman that lives just a couple of blocks from Finley. Um, there are several things that have been already answered, but I feel that further uh, clear, well, details, I would be happy to get more information. Um, you mentioned uh, symptomatic uh, uh, being, uh, persons being tested, but this uh, COVID-19 has been known to be um, amongst asymptomatic uh, people as well. And because they will be out in the community dur during the day, 
Um, I'm curious on your testing uh, and whether uh, um, it will be done frequently enough. And the other question is, I know that I would feel better as a resident not to just have the public, uh, public health department or director, some type of representation in the meeting. I'm thinking of having that presence, public health presence in partnering with you guys to make sure, uh, you know, that there's a hand in there that's, that's um, going to be apprised of the situation, which leads me to one of my other questions is will we be informed if there is a breakout amongst amongst the the encampment and the other thing is will you mandate the use of masks um they won't uh i'm it's my understanding that there will no be not be laundry or shower facilities so washing hands will help but uh there's other uh, facets to to hygiene and cleanliness. So that's okay. That's my questions. Okay, Judith, thank you. I, I think we have four parts. Um, I'll start going again and backwards. There will be showers and restrooms and hand washing stations on site. Of course, if there's a, a breakout of the pandemic, we'll be informing everyone. Love to have. Um, and we will be building a public health presence with our partners at the county. And you, you might have heard earlier that St. Joseph Health is there twice a week, or is it three times a week, Ginny Lynn? Twice. Um, and go ahead. I see your mic's off. You probably have a few things you want to share. No, you did a great job. But, uh, yeah, I, I, as, our, as Dave already mentioned, um, you know, there will be laundry. There will be showers. There will be restrooms. There will be hand-washing stations. So all of those things will be provided, as well as um, – uh, three meals a day for individuals that are that are living there. Um, in terms of uh, again, people being uh, safe, this is to provide a safer alternative to what is already existing in our community. Uh, you know, we will again be following all public health guidelines, including the social distancing of 12 feet between tents, which is the CDC's guidance, six feet as the people are in communal uh, environment. You know, the communal spaces. Uh, we will also be um, helping people with face coverings. That is part of the public health uh, guidelines right now is that people, while they're out in, in, you know, out in the public, they need to be wearing face coverings. So we'll, you know, when we had that mandate first come out at our facilities, we made sure that we were helping people learn how to create them, fashion them, be creative. Um, we're, we're always soliciting donations around that right now to get more face coverings for individuals to get them access. So that will continue to be a huge part of our programs and operations. Um, and uh, again, following all of the guidelines uh, around safe protocols for COVID-19. I will say to this date, um, with some of the preventative measures we've taken and the, and the quick action to do some social distancing within the shelters and to um, create you know, these enhanced preventative measures, uh, to this date, we have not had a, a single positive case in any cafeteria shelters. Uh, so uh, we will continue the protocols we've had and the testing will continue to be a high priority for anybody that we uh, find that symptomatic um, and or, you know, needs uh, further evaluation. So that'll be an ongoing monitoring that we will do uh, at this site. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Teresa, followed by A. Lynn. Teresa, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you to everyone who's on the panel and for all the excellent questions from participants. My concern is not uh, this controlled uh, uh, homeless shelter. It's that there's already one tent over there, uh, someone obviously homeless living in it in the parking lot, uh, right at the corner, like I would say the northwest corner, inside the parking lot, there is a tent. And this seems to be contagious because people are in survival mode. Now, what's going to stop people from seeing tents they are controlled? And then next thing you know, we wake up with 20 more tents in the other parts of the parking lot. Um, and I guess that's my main question. Thank you, Teresa. So I do know we're planning to manage the parking lot by closing it at curfew. 
and reopening it in the morning. Um, surprised to hear a tent's shown up. Uh, the, uh, the intention is that we will not allow any other people that aren't registered at the Finley site to occupy any space on the Finley property. And I, I, I can state it as simply as that. Um, anybody else on the panel want to amplify something? It, it's, that's as clear as I can be, I think. Thank yeah, you. I think just to follow up on that, we'll be working closely with the city staff there and the police department be in partnership. But now to understand what's gonna change the landscape of this is we have a place for them to go now and that doesn't exist right now. So as of next week, we're gonna have 70 of these tents and I think people are anxious for this opportunity and that's gonna be a game changer for us in this. And I think hopefully that's gonna mitigate a lot of those concerns. Good point. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from A. Lynn followed by Katie. I have unmuted your mic, Aylin, and please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, this is Alice Lynn. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for providing this planned emergency tent village for our unsheltered. It's a great step both for the unsheltered and housed to have an intentional, well-planned village during this crisis. I welcome an additional planned tent or safe parking village at the park nearest my residence. I have a process question because best processes ensure best outcomes. It's in the best interest of the unhoused, the city and taxpayers to have a diversity rather than a monopoly of operators of publicly funded emergency shelters to ensure healthy competition for shelter contracts to treat clients better and get people permanently housed as quickly as possible. Home Sonoma County was formed two years ago of public officials and a technical advisory committee or TAC of 25 community experts on homelessness. As a lived experience TAC member who has researched and championed planned villages more than anyone on the TAC, I would like to know why haven't the TAC and TAC Emerging Issues Task Group, led by Ms. Holmes, formed for emergencies like this, been included in the planning of this village. We haven't met in five months on Zoom or been given an opportunity to give input on this, including on the operator chosen to manage this site. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Hello. Um, I heard mostly comment there. Did anybody have a hear a question that um, we might want to respond to around home Sonoma County or kind of off the focus of Finley? But Alice, I would just encourage you to share your comments with the full council, um, certainly at the next home Sonoma County Leadership Council board as well. Thanks. Okay, the next comment, or pardon me, question will be from Katie, followed by Randy. Katie, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Hi there, thanks so much for taking my question. Uh, my question is about drug and alcohol use uh, on the Finley site. Uh, my understanding is there is no drugs and alcohol allowed within the encampment. Um, here are my questions. One. We know that drugs and alcohol will be obtained and used off-site, so residents will be coming back under the influence. Similar to Sonoma State University's guidelines for searching residents upon re-entry, will these residents be searched when they re-enter the camp? Second, what will that search look like? Third, who will conduct the search? Will it be Catholic charities or security guards? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Uh, sounds like a, a operational question, and Janine Lynn, your mic's already off, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, so we certainly um, will be holding a, a pretty robust uh, understanding that people who we will not be allowing any drugs or alcohol on the site, and any al drugs or alcohol that are found uh, to be in, in someone's possession on the site would be. Uh, grounds for dismissal from the program, again, for the safety of the site um, and other individuals in the site. 
Uh, in terms of people who might be coming uh, to the site under the influence, we are a behavior-based program, so we will be managing and overseeing behavior that affects the health and safety of, of the site and the surrounding community. Um, if someone is under the influence and their behavior is such that it threatens the health and safety of, that, uh, of the site, we would take immediate action to uh, resolve that situation. But conversely, if someone is not under the influence of drugs or alcohol and they do have behavior that negatively affects the site from a health and safety perspective, we will also be resolving that issue. So we will be looking at behaviors um, for the individual to uh, make sure that everybody in the surrounding community and in the site is safe. So um, we are not doing it based on sobriety, we're viewing it based on behavior. Um, in terms of the question around search, uh, we, we at this point do not have planned searches uh, that we will be executing. We do um, have a vast experience as well as our security company and the potential in, in looking at, you know, potential uh, red flags or risks that might come associated. We will deal with those on a case by case basis, but we will not necessarily have a protocol that we will be searching everybody when they come and go from the site. Um, Again, most of these individuals that we work with um, are, are there to be safe. And so uh, we'll be continuing to encourage the health and safety perspective uh, from the participants and continuing to manage that um, from a perspective of uh, helping people along the pathway towards sobriety and also making sure that people's behavior is such that um, they're safe and their, their partners at the site are safe as well. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Randy, followed by LBK. Randy, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Got it, am I clear? Yes. Fantastic, okay, a uh, few questions. Uh, so you stated that people living in Finley, uh, we've filtered, I guess, somehow um, to pull aside the sexual predators and criminals who have previously been convicted, how will that be done? And how will those same potentially predatory criminals be eliminated from the local community being a danger and risk to those of us who live close by? Um, secondly, how about the folks who are living there um, who are continuing to use drugs? If there's no drug use allowed in the encampment, how will that be enforced? How are we filtering out the people who are using drugs, trying to bring in the people that are the most vulnerable at the same time, keeping out those same people that uh, you know have a long history of uh, addiction. So it, lastly, I guess the people who refuse to be sheltered there are those who continue to use intravenous drugs like we've seen over on <clears throat> Joe Dota Trail, heroin or meth, refuse to go to Finley because they know the drug use is not tolerated. What are we going to do with those folks in the rest of the community? Since we all know housing first is a failed agenda, will the city continue to supply drugs to the homeless people that are living in Finley? Alcohol and tobacco, I guess, as well, um, like we've seen at Los Gilicos. Okay, Randy, thank you for some, a three-part question. It's, it's dealing with uh, sort of screening um, people that would be sexual predators from being at the Finley site, uh, management of use of drugs, and then I'm, I think you had a question about refusing services. What do we do community-wide? Did I hear that correctly? Well, maybe your hand's lowered, sorry. Well, maybe, Ginny Lynn, can we talk again through some operational um, perspectives about uh, screening the predators and the, the use of drugs and alcohol? And yeah. before we start, let me just say that uh, we've been at this since 6 o'clock. Uh, maybe we just go with, what does the group think? Maybe three more questions, Max, and then we wrap up? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead, Ginny Lynn. Yeah, so um, hopefully, remind me if I missed one of the questions, but um, in terms of the screening, so 
uh, as uh, Captain Creek had mentioned earlier, we will not be accepting people who are um, registered sex offenders. There is a process to check that. We, we check the website um, and, and make sure that individuals are uh, not on that website if they would preclude them from coming into the site. Um, in terms of managing uh, the alcohol and drug uh, behavior, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're dealing with behavioral issues. Again, there are people who maybe are under the influence and their behavior affects the, in, um, the health and safety, but there's also people who are not under the influence where that could be a similar circumstance. Again, this is true in the housed and unhoused population. So this runs across multiple um, populations in our community. And so we will continue to monitor that behavior um, and make sure that people who are actively um, trying to go towards the path of recovery as have access to referrals and have access to the opportunities that allow them to continue that pathway towards um, sobriety. And that often is the case. And um, what we find in the sites that we operate is we actually, uh, once someone has an establishment of a place that's safe to be, they often are open to the looking at the next phase of actual recovery and, and moving forward in that way. So that's why our on-site staff that's trained in these um, different fields allows them to kind of provide the resources and referrals that we wouldn't have had maybe if they were on an um, not inside of this program. So that's, that's an important component for us to continue to, um, to, to provide that resource for individuals, whether they're on the, you know, in one of our encampments or whether they're in this, in this site. I think, I don't know if I missed any other questions. Let me know if I did, but, um, that, that's going to be the real differentiating factor. And I, and I just want to say one more time, you know, this, you know, alcohol and, and drug use is something that is, a whole social issue in and of itself. Um, it, it again, it does not discriminate whether you're housed or unhoused in, in many scenarios. And so there are whole systems and whole um, referral processes and community-based organizations and county, you know, just you know, uh, departments that work on this issue. Uh, again, running the gamut whether you're unhoused or or a housed individual. Thank you, Jenny Lynn. Okay, the next question will be from LBK, followed by Santa Rosa resident, and the last question will be from Diana. LBK, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is, hi, this is Lindsay, um, and I'm a, uh, I'm a neighbor here in, in Northwest Santa Rosa. I regularly go, um, go running up by the Finley Center and um, sort of run through that parking lot. Um, first, I just want to take um, take a minute and thank everyone who's on this. Uh, the work you all have done with setting this up is really thorough, and um, I just appreciate it. I also want to take a moment and just appreciate um, what I heard Jenny Lynn say um, about uh, addiction, drug use, and alcohol abuse uh, not being limited to the homeless population. I think I would just also add that um, uh, sexual predators are not entirely housed within the homeless population either. Um, so uh, I really appreciate you saying that, Jenny Lynn, because I think um, we should really resist these sort of morally flawed arguments that suggest uh, that homeless people are, um, are to blame for a lot of the social ills in our society. Um, the thing I want to ask really is about how uh, those of us who are nearby here can, um, can be good neighbors um, I heard some folks, you know, concerned about um, about uh, maybe maybe these folks who are moving in potentially uh, spreading COVID nineteen, and I kind of heard some stuff about uh, about face masks. So I'm just sort of um, wondering uh, if there's some way that um, there are things that we could we could donate to to help out the folks who um, who are going to be moving in. You know, whether it's it's homemade face masks or um, are there things you all need uh, or ways that neighbors could, could kind of show up and, and welcome these folks and, and help to take care of them as they, as they come to temporarily live in our neighborhood? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, I think we mentioned earlier about a way to manage donations, not just for Finley, but the whole wide system of care that Catholic Charities is operating. So maybe a, a, just a quick summary review, Jenny Lynn, just... Um, capture that? 
Yeah, um, thank you. So yeah, we will definitely, again, we're in a unique situation. Cafeterias is usually very reliant on volunteers and, and bringing lots of people in to help in our programs. But obviously in this situation of a pandemic, we are having to kind of change those protocols a little bit and not have as much outside influence in our sites. Just again, to limit exposure both both ways. Uh, we want to protect the people in our programs. Uh, so volunteering is going to be probably on a uh, on a very limited case by case basis. Um, we we definitely will be looking for certain in kind donations, and we will post something on the city's uh, frequently asked questions webpage, kind of a listing of things. But I can tell you right now, what will be at the top is face coverings. Um, so that's something that we're going to be in a continuous need, not only for this site but all of our. Um, homeless service operations. So face coverings, people who are willing to um, sew masks or donate masks uh, or whatever that might be. There's some really creative things I've seen in the community. Um, that's going to be the number one top of the list. And um, it would be beautiful to see, you know, neighbors who want to help donate to that. That would be a great cause. Um, other things that we can always use is, um, you know, other hand sanitizing or other uh, items of that sort that we can give maybe individual ones that individuals can take with them and have as part of their personal um, kind of, you know, when they're wandering, you know, uh, leaving the site for essential services, they're able to have that access to that. We will be providing some for on the site, but uh, equipping individuals with personal hand sanitizer and other um, items like that would be very um, welcomed as well. But we'll put a more comprehensive list on the city's uh, website. Yeah, Kelly, I think you had something you wanted to add. Just real quick, and Jenny Lynn already mentioned um, that we're going to be updating our website, so thank you for that. Um, I just want to say I've been taking notes tonight, so any questions, concerns, including all this great input from um, the community about how we can help and how we can be good neighbors, um, I will be um, updating our FAQ with that so people know how they can help. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, the next question is from Santa Rosa resident, followed by Diana is the follow, uh, final question of the evening. Uh, Santa Rosa resident, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, I am going to start by saying I hope I won't be judged by some of the callers who think that we, it is incorrect to acknowledge that sometimes the homeless are not good neighbors, um, because I think that is the case. Um, uh, but I, I do understand that there will be a lot of control over this particular um, site, because it will be a managed site. Um, but my uh, concern is, when the site was chosen, um, I, was, I was pretty shocked that a park was being chosen uh, because we know that parks are already kind of a magnet for the homeless. And was uh, consideration given that you may now have um, uh, made Finley Park a magnet for the homeless um, in the future? That's my question. Well, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start with maybe stating that, again, this is a temporary arrangement to get through a health crisis so that we can create safe social distancing. This is not envisioned to be there beyond the shelter in place or until we have alternative solutions identified, as we mentioned earlier. I don't know if that attracts homeless into the future. I, I don't have any data point on that. I don't know if any member of the panel knows, but uh, just, so that's my comment on that. Kelly, maybe you can contribute something. Oh, you turned your mic off. No, no, no. I, I meant to turn it on. No, I just want to say that I think that we, the panel and everybody working on this, we have thought through a lot of the contingencies um, and, and have been prepared as we possibly can tonight to answer all your questions. And some of the things we won't know until we um, operate the program and get the program up and running. And so I think that um, a couple of people on the panel have already mentioned we will continue to evaluate it moving forward. And um, should an issue arise around uh, potentially the site attracting more people, mm -hmm. then we will take steps to address that. 
True. Yeah, I would just reiterate what Kelly just said. She, uh, took the words out of my mouth, and um, and and please let you know, let us know what what we could be doing, and and the evaluation process will be ongoing. Um, and uh, we'll you know we can add other additional resources as situations might arise, and and in how we might need to to refocus certain efforts as well. So, um, this is going to be an ongoing evaluative process, um, and and definitely kind of a first of its kind in terms of its operations in the city. So. Um, we, we do plan that as part of our, our ongoing operations and we appreciate feedback from the community as you see things from an operational standpoint. I am happy to address those um, from, from the uh, operator, operator stand, uh, perspective. And was, I, will add, I will add that uh, we're going to share the numbers again to contact us. So if you observe things that you feel are different or, or shouldn't be there in the first place, by all means, contact us whether it's law enforcement or our homeless services number, things of that nature. David, Sorry. if I could just add, it, it, it's an experience that the city has had along Prince Memorial Greenway. One of the best ways to make sure the behaviors uh, of any public space uh, are used appropriately is to have a lot of people using it in that a, a, appropriate manner. So I would encourage neighbors, which you can do, enjoy Finley Park. Come and enjoy Finley Park and all the amenities that are there within the framework of the public health uh, order. Don't avoid the park because that's not gonna help anyone. Good point. Okay, the final question of the evening is from Diana. Diana, I have enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. And I am surprised that I am able to be a, a double dipper because I did uh, offer a question earlier. And thank you for extending the time on this uh, town hall meeting. My, my question has to do with the fact that I am currently a resident of the Oakmont community out in East Santa Rosa off of Highway 12, where we have recently, uh, across the highway at Los Gilagos, opened up a temporary uh, homeless encampment uh, center in hopes of moving more uh, homeless folks into temporary and then on to long-term housing. I was a resident of the local community of uh, the Finley Center. I lived just, you know, probably less than half a mile away and often walked in the Finley Center Park. Now, having um, been a, a resident of Oakmont for almost a year and through this transition with the Los Gilagos uh, temporary housing, I have come to, to know that the Los Gilagos temporary housing program is not temporary. It was due to close on April 30th of this uh, year. And there was staunch um, opposition to this shelter being located so far from the community uh, center, Santa Rosa Center, that would provide needed services for these, uh, for these individuals. It's not temporary. It looks like it's gonna be long-term. Now, COVID-19 probably has changed as it has changed all of our outcomes and services that we're looking for. So I guess my question has to do is, is how different is this temporary COVID-19 uh, social distance site from the Highway 12 Los Gilagos temporary housing for our local community um, homeless population. And I understand that Catholic Charities is, is uh, front and center in providing for Santa Rosa City uh, these community services for our homeless, as is uh, St. Vincent's de Paul for providing services for um, individuals at Los Gilagos. So how how is uh, St. Vincent de Paul and Catholic Charities coordinating services that, so that a temporary program does not turn into long-term? And what do we see for long-term housing transition for our homeless population? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Diana. I, I do know that COVID-19 did change the path of travel for many of uh, homeless service operations. 
Um, I know it, it really put the county in a different place by trying to respond to that. I know, Tina, you have some thoughts. Um, there was a part of your question about, um, well, I guess back to, yeah, it sounds like Los Gilicos is going to be there longer because of the distraction, if that's the right word, for trying to respond to a health crisis. Uh, Tina, anything to add to that? Or I just, I just don't want to get with a response, I suppose. Well, I can say that uh, Los Gilicos has operated for three months. Uh, in March, uh, we had a board meeting, I believe it was March 11th or March 10th. The board did vote to extend the Los Gilicos site for an additional six months. So it is still temporary. Um, in lieu of um, exploring our indoor outdoor shelter uh, proposal. So then of course the pandemic hit. And so that of course <laughs> had, you know, threw everything off schedule. And um, the Los Gilicos side currently um, has, uh, even in the midst of this pandemic, been able to move some of its residents into uh, permanent supportive housing while they are still uh, housing those individuals that are in the site um, and sheltering in place. So we've not been able to move others in right now because of the uh, health order, but um, it is still currently um, temporary and our indoor outdoor uh, shelter plans are still uh, in movement, uh, although slowly moving because of this pandemic, but we're still strategizing uh, a transition plan uh, after the fact, post pandemic. So we're still working on these things. Good. Yeah, short term, medium term, and long term. Yeah. So, Dean, I think that's the, uh, or Jenny Lynn, your mic came off. You want to say a few words? Yes, I think there was a question around Cavacheries and St. Vincent de Paul partnering. So, we partner with oh. all of our, our nonprofit partners, especially in the area of um, homeless service operations. So, um, there's a multitude of partners that are, are working to create a safety net for people experiencing homelessness. And, um, you know, St. Vincent de Paul is one we regularly communicate with and, and have a lot of shared uh, individuals that we, we serve together. Um, and I think there was a, a, a quick mention in there around the long-term housing transition plans. I mean, again, that is the entire focus of our of, of Catholic Charities whole uh, homeless service infrastructure is to get people housed. Um, a lot of our, our shelters and in these interventions are very important to get people out of very dangerous and unhealthy situations in our encampments in um, terms of their own safety and their own medical needs. Uh, but really, they, our long-term goal is that these are, are short-term interventions that ultimately are a process by which we can get people into housing. And our focus is resolving people's homelessness, not managing it, resolving it for the individuals. And so last year, Catholic Charities was able to house 650 people out of homelessness and into permanent housing. And that's an, a number we're going to continue to shoot for here. And it's also something we're going to work with the individuals in this site is to provide permanent housing options and pathways out of homelessness. So that is, that is our focus in all of this is keeping people safe and, and moving them into housing. Keeping people safe and leading them into housing. Well said. And so, Dina, was that our last uh, caller? That was. Okay, before I turn it to the, over to the mayor for some closing remarks, I, I just wanted to uh, thank the members of the public, uh, thank the panel for, um, you know, this is, a, this is a very tough subject, made more complicated with the challenge within the emergency situation. Appreciate people listening to us. And, and providing some ideas to participate. That really means a lot. Want to remind folks that we have a web page, srcity.org slash COVID-19 homeless support. We have an email address if you want to provide some feedback, homeless at srcity.org. And starting tomorrow, ideally by nine o'clock, we have a voicemail box, 543-4605 that if you didn't get your point across tonight or you have additional questions you think of or comments, please email or call us. We're, we want to hear from you. We want to develop the best systems going forward. So, Mayor, did you want to say anything before we wrapped up tonight? 
Yes, I'll be very brief. Just to echo some of your sentiments. Thank you to everyone for their participation. You know, originally we scheduled this for an hour and a half, and now we're on to three hours because this is such an important uh, topic, and it, it's a very complex topic. You know, ending homelessness is really easy, housing, but how to get there, that's the challenging part. And there is no um, framework for any other community who's had to deal with COVID-19. Um, and so it, we're, we're creating this as we go. And I just want, hopefully everyone who's been participating or listening gets the sense that there's a lot of folks, city, county, state, federal employees working behind the scenes to try to get us the resources there. So I just have uh, two asks or two um, opportunities for a continued public involvement. One of the things that I, I, with the city council, along with my colleagues, uh, same thing with the uh, board of supervisors, we're continually talking with our representatives in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. to get additional funding to come to Sonoma County to help us address some of these issues. You might have read in today's paper, yesterday's paper, the HEROES Act is going before Congress, I believe, tomorrow. Um, I'm pretty confident it's going to pass Congress, but then getting through the Senate may be another challenge. So I would encourage everyone, if you have an interest in some of these dollars coming locally, write to your senators, especially if you know any senators out of state that may not be supportive of some of the actions that the state of California is um, taking. But that makes a difference. Hearing from members of our community who think these federal dollars can really help us in our situation, please don't sit idle. Don't be passive in that. Let them know you think this county of Sonoma uh, has earned the right to have some of those federal dollars coming our way. And secondly, next Tuesday, we have a Santa Rosa City Council meeting. There is public comment period there. This is not an agenda topic, but you are uh, you have an opportunity over three minutes to provide the entire city council with your thoughts about this project or anything else going in the city. So I invite you to be an active participant in your community. Tuesday, we start at uh, noontime, because if you wanna hear about the budget of the city of Santa Rosa, we're starting at noon. But at four o'clock, we'll start a regular uh, council meeting and at five o'clock, we'll be open to some public comments. So please participate. A lot of opportunity. I know I, along the, the rest of the city council members, are really interested in hearing what this community has to say. So thank you for our, all of your participation. Final words, David? You covered it, Mayor. Thank you very much. And thanks. thank you to the panelists and the members that participated tonight. Great. Good night, all. Good night.